Hampshire County Superior Court, back in session, you may be seated. Your Honor, for the record, this is a continuation of the trial of Commonwealth v. Cara Rendalla, 1180-CR-128. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. All right, so I believe you have the second draft of the instructions. As I told you yesterday, the draft I got to you yesterday was a rough draft. There were many typos, many he's and him's that I had to convert to she's and her's, et cetera. I received another motion from the Commonwealth this morning. That I'd like to go through quickly before closing arguments. So, one of which has to do with the humane practice instruction. And I do tend to agree with the Commonwealth. Your Honor, frankly, I have been working on our own edits to your second draft of your instruction. And so I'm still, I haven't even looked at all of the Commonwealth's latest motion. But if you could just direct me to which page you're looking at. It's the, well, it's page 15. Page 15, okay. Thank you. 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 So, I gave this, so that reads, well, it's the same instruction I gave at the time. But at the time, as you may recall, I was laboring under the erroneous belief that Miranda warnings had been given. And I think including that part of the instruction here is confusing. And I attempted to address that confusion by instructing the jury that whether the statements, or whether the interview was custodial, or the interrogation was custodial. And therefore, those warnings were required, was not up to them. But I think that may even add to the confusion. As I indicated, based on your objection or your motion, I found that the interrogation was not custodial. That finding, in fact, became more robust in my view as I heard more evidence. And so, therefore, those warnings weren't required and they weren't given. And I think that the instruction, as it relates to those instructions, or those warnings rather, makes more sense. And really only makes sense when those warnings are given. And so, I'm inclined to remove that portion of the instruction. I'll hear you on that if you wish to argue, but that's what I'm inclined to do. Just so you're aware of that in terms of your closing arguments. So, very briefly, our position would be that the fact that Miranda warnings were not given is relevant to the humane practice instruction, and specifically to the voluntariness of the statement. But I would actually agree with you that the way it was framed in your both first and second model, I'm looking at page 14 of your second draft. So, the second, the beginning of the second full paragraph, you need not decide whether. My view is we should actually strike that first sentence. You need not decide whether the defendant was in custody. I would start the sentence, you may consider whether the defendant was given Miranda warnings, along with other factors described in determining whether the defendant made her statement voluntarily. So, we think that Miranda warnings do bear, 
the, the presence or absence of Miranda warnings, or in this case, the lack of Miranda warnings, do bear on the voluntariness of the statement. So we would ask that you include that portion. But I understand your ruling. OK, thank you. And we would note our, note our objection. Yes. Also, the, the Commonwealth has indicated it's not going to um, use the term alibi. And so um, my understanding from yesterday was that um, if the Commonwealth isn't going to say it, I don't need to instruct on it. But I don't know if uh, your position has changed since then. Our position has changed. We think that uh, an alibi instruction is helpful uh, in any event. And so it's our position that notwithstanding the Commonwealth is not going to use uh, the term, we would request that the court include the alibi instruction. Turning your attention to page 35. Uh, 35 of your draft, right? Yes. My draft. Yeah. So th there's some language that I, I believe is optional concerning um, information disclosed. Oh, although oh, oh, I think I, yeah, right. Um, If you just direct me with specific language um, you're talking about on page 35. So when I say the, the language is optional, it's optional in the SJC's model and instruction. Uh, I left it in there, but I'm inclined to take it out. So it's uh, the, the, the language is, but there may be reasonable provocation where the person killed discloses information that would cause a reasonable person to lose her self-control and learning of the matter disclosed did actually cause the defendant to do so. Oh, it's page 34, sorry. I'm just, okay. Yeah, I, I actually don't think that's particularly relevant on the facts of this case, so I would actually agree with you that that optional language should be removed. But, but, um, but yeah, uh, right. Um, well, I guess, Mike, I, sorry, I, I apologize because I'm just trying to catch up here. But the first sentence, so you're suggesting keeping the first sentence. Mere words, no matter how insulting, uh, you're not ordinarily by themselves constantly reasonable provocation. I guess, I guess my view is the entire paragraph should come out. Well, I'm not going to take out the entire paragraph. But okay. I, I'm going to remove that uh, optional language. Yeah, I mean, so, right, I, just to repeat, I, note our objection, I understand. Our position is, if you get, either the whole paragraph comes out or, uh, or, or the whole paragraph stays in, but uh, I understand your ruling, just note our objection. So I, I think that's all I need to address before closing arguments as, as to the, the Commonwealth's um, additional proposed revisions. We had a, a few, just very quickly, uh, uh, defense uh, points to raise. We're happy to raise them after. Uh, that's, that's fine. So, so my plan is to um, bring in the jury. Uh, we'll, we'll do closing arguments, and then we'll take 
our morning break, and it may be a lengthier uh, break so that we can deal with uh, issues related to the charge. That's fine. Sir, if I could just clarify one point on the alibi issue. Uh, I'm not sure if Your Honor has decided one way or the other or is still considering that, but if Your Honor uh, knows at this point that you are inclined to give an alibi instruction, um, that may affect whether or not we use that word. Sure. So, and our position would be, Your Honor, if you do decide out of an abundance of caution to give that instruction, we would strongly request the modifications that we propose to it. Uh, but we continue to believe that it doesn't really fit nicely with the facts of this case. Thank you. Okay. So, I, I am inclined to give the instruction. I, again, I thought yesterday there was an understanding that if the Commonwealth didn't make that argument that I uh, that there would be no need for the instruction. Um, and it's okay. That position has changed. So I'm going to give the instruction. I, I, I may use that that language. It doesn't, to me, make that much of a difference. I understand uh, the point of it. it. Do I need to decide that right now? No. Okay. But I, I do plan on giving an alibi instruction. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, we're content to resolve uh, our additional points afterwards. Okay. So. <laughs> sure. Is everything set up? Do you have what you need, Council? Yes, Sean. Yes, morning. Uh, so I have to ask you once again uh, if any 
one of you had any difficulty following the instructions that I gave you uh, before we broke yesterday and that I've been giving you uh, throughout the trial, uh, which are to uh, refrain from discussing this case with anyone, including each other, uh, to refrain from any form of outside research or investigation, uh, to avoid uh, contact uh, with any of the participants in this case, and to avoid all media accounts concerning this case. Uh, if anyone had any difficulty following any of those instructions, please raise your hand. And I see no response. Members of the jury, you are about to hear closing arguments by the attorneys. This is an important part of the trial because it is the final opportunity given to the lawyers to address you. It is an opportunity for the lawyers to summarize the evidence, to call your attention to certain parts of the evidence that they regard as important, and based on the evidence, to try to persuade you to reach a certain result. However, what you are about to hear is not evidence. Lawyers are not witnesses. All the evidence in this case has been presented through the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits, uh, and you will have an opportunity to examine and consider that evidence during your deliberations. Our rules are designed to ensure that the parties receive a fair trial, and they therefore prohibit the attorneys from making certain types of arguments in an effort to persuade you to reach a certain result or to favor or discredit either party. For example, the attorneys are not permitted to refer to facts that are not in evidence in this case. If based on your memory and understanding of the evidence, a lawyer does this, you should disregard the, that comment. While the attorneys are allowed to comment generally on the credibility of witnesses, they are not permitted to express their personal belief in the credibility or lack of credibility of any witness who testified in this case. That determination is entirely for you to make. If a lawyer expresses such a personal belief, you should disregard that comment. This case must be decided solely on the basis of the admissible evidence and the law that I give to you. Attorneys are not permitted to persuade you for or against either party by appealing to human passions or prejudices. If a lawyer makes such a comment, you should disregard the comment. If you become conscious of any passion or prejudice as you consider the evidence or engage in your deliberations, you must put these feelings aside and not permit them to influence you in your thinking. Attorney uh, Scapiccio. Thank you, told you in my opening. This entire case was based on a lie. It started with the 911 call. It started when the 911 call operator said, this is a domestic. Now there's no evidence it was a domestic. The call didn't play the 911 call for you. You have to understand it's their burden. They played the 2009 911 call that Kyra and Tala makes, but they don't introduce this one on this case? You can consider that when you're considering reasonable doubt because it's the Commonwealth's burden here. And what about Roy Dupuy? We know from Detective Whitney that he didn't say anything about a domestic. But when you're considering this case, you should consider why you didn't hear from Roy Dupuy. Because that's reasonable doubt. Now, when you get beyond the fact that all of the first responders believed this was a domestic, that's based on a lie, then what happens in this case? Then you have that lie perpetuated by Trupa McGarrian. Again, where is he? Commonwealth's burden to prove this case. He is the lead detective and they don't call him. 
when you're thinking about whether or not the Commonwealth has proved this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Think about that. Because if you're sitting here wondering what Trooper McGarrian would have said, that's reasonable doubt. Now, what do we know, and a little bit that we know about Trooper McGarrian? That he makes a phone call when he gets to the house that night. And he says to, to Dr. Richmond, if I have someone that is stiff as a board and cold as ice, could that have happened in three to four hours? And that's their whole time of death that they talked about. And what we know about time of death is that it's not exact, that you could never prove something beyond reasonable doubt based on time of death alone. And then everybody talked about Ryder or Rigger, or however you say it. Let's say Ryder, okay? You can't decide anything about time of death based on Ryder alone. And what else do they have here? They have Trooper McGarrian setting the stage, perpetuating the lie when he calls to try to say, is this possible? Now, why do you think he's doing that? Well, we already know. They think Carter and Tyler is a suspect. Because they think it's a domestic. So when he makes that call to Dr. Richmond, and he says, hey, is this possible? You remember Dr. Littman just testified yesterday. And she said if there were two additional facts, two additional facts that Trooper McGarrian knew that he didn't tell Dr. Richmond, which was evidence of a struggle and evidence that the victim in this case, Anne Marie Rintala, had, had some adipose tissue. We need to find out it's a BMI of 33. Those two factors alone, according to Dr. Littman, would have moved that six to eight to the left and made that time period earlier. Now, how early? Dr. Lippman told you she can't say. But you can't rule out three to four hours before they found her. And you can't even rule out two to three hours before they found her. And Dr. Richmond agreed evidence of a struggle increases the rate at which you develop rhyme. Dr. Andrews agreed that a struggle increases the rate at which you develop rider. Both of them agreed that a BMI of 33 increases the rate at which you develop rider. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't change their initial determination of the window based on the facts of this case. And the call is going to want you to believe, and just so we all know, they get the last word here. They get to hear what I say and respond to me. I don't get to respond to them. So I have to anticipate what they're going to say and try to address it in my closing. But I believe the Commonwealth is going to say, our experts, Dr. Richmond and Dr. Andrews, were reliable because they didn't have any information. They just did what they were supposed to do. Well, here's the problem with that. Dr. Lippman told you that you always consider the fact that, that someone says they see the victim alive at a certain date time. And in this case, none of them ever considered the fact that Cara Rintala saw Anne Marie Rintala alive at 3 o'clock before she left. The only one who considered that was Dr. Lippman. And Dr. Lippman told you, unless there's evidence to the contrary, then of course you have to consider that. And was there evidence to the contrary here? No. No, there wasn't. And evidence to the contrary is if she says she saw Ian Marie Rintala alive at 3 o'clock and her phone says she's in Alaska, evidence to the contrary. You wouldn't believe that. You'd discount it. No evidence here of that. If she says she saw Ian Marie Rintala alive at 3 o'clock, but you have her on video entering a movie theater at 3 o'clock, evidence to the contrary. You wouldn't consider that. Not evidence here. They decided to exclude what Cara Rintala told them because, again, going back to the domestic, going back to the bias, going back to the fact that they believe from the very beginning when they got that call that Cara Rintala was the only suspect. And how do we know that? When we heard from the crime scene people who were collecting the evidence the next day, they told you, they filled out these reports, these forms, and who did they list as a suspect? Cara Rintala. Nobody else, just Cara Rintala. So we know day one they're believing what they heard about the domestic. Day one, they're leaving out information for their doctor to make a proper assessment. 
day one, they're, they're adding hypotheticals that only tell half a story. And that's what the evidence showed. And when you talk about time of death, what we know for sure is Ryer alone can't do it. And what we know for sure is that that six to eight is everybody in the whole world. It doesn't represent a bell curve of somebody who's been involved in a violent struggle. It doesn't represent people who, who necessarily have a BMI of 33. When you consider those two factors, Dr. Lippman told you that now the three to four might be the top of the range. Not is, might be the top of the range. Now the two to three isn't an outlier. It's right within that bell curve. When you look at all the facts, that's what you come up with. And what did Dr. Andrews say? He said, well, I agree that violent struggle will um, increase the rate at Ryder. I agree that a BMI of 33 um, would increase the rate of Ryder. But the floor was so cold that I think they cancel each other out. It was a wash. Remember that testimony wash? Here's the problem with that, is that he said to you from that stand that the temperature that he, uh, he assessed this on in the cellar was 72 degrees. 72 degrees. Now, most people put their heat on 68. But this is a March day in the spring, and it's 72 degrees. So what are we talking about? How, how cold could the cellar floor have been? If the, if the temperature of that room is 72 degrees. But that's what Dr. Andrews told you. And Dr. Andrews, you remember, is the one who said the window that he started with was 10 to 1. And that's fine. Everybody starts with, with a place that they think is appropriate. But when you look at the evidence here, which he said, I'm relying on the phone records. The phone records were important to me. The phone records show she was alive at 10, she was alive at 11. She was alive at 12. So now doesn't your window move when you know that if you, you can't say a specific number. You can't say less than an hour. You can't say 30. He even said, I would never say 39 minutes is, is, is appropriate. I would never say that. But when you look at his window and you realize, and he admitted, 10 o'clock is out, 11 o'clock is out, 12 o'clock is out up to 12.20. So doesn't that take your window from 12, 21, three hours this way? But he won't move it. He told you what increases Roger. He told you that the cold, the 72 degrees in the room, uh, which is heat for some people, increased uh, or decreased the rate of, of Roger in this case. And he said it was a wash. One canceled out the other. But you still can't get beyond why he's not moving his window. Why he sat on that stand and thought about how appropriate it was to keep that window, to not consider all these things because they were a wash. Well, what if he's wrong? What if you look at the evidence and determine 72 degrees? That's pretty cold. How cold was it down there? How cold was the floor? You know how you could have found out? Someone did their job. If someone went down there and took the ambient temperature of the floor, took the ambient temperature of that room, but we know for sure, 72 degrees. And I'm not saying a cellar floor, a cement cellar floor, isn't going to be colder than the temperature of the room. We all believe that. But cold enough to cancel out the violent struggle? Cold enough to cancel out the BMI? Dr. Whitman said, Dr. Littman said that although you can't say definitively a time of death, you can't make exact um, interpretations of a time of death, you've got to consider all the evidence. And she told you in this case, when she was tasked with determining whether or not it was possible for Anne Marie Rattala to have been killed after 3 o'clock, she said that it was. And she based that on things the Commonwealth refused to acknowledge and refused to, to consider. And that is 
the, the violent struggle, and the BMI. And so the poem is going to talk to you about outliers and how you can't, can't rely on outliers. According to Dr. Lindman, it wasn't an outlier. Once you consider those two things, then that mean of six to eight hours moves. It's earlier than six to eight hours. Could she say it was an hour? No. Could she say it was two hours? No. But could she say it's not, it, it, it's, it, you can't rule it out? Yeah. You can't rule it out. You can't rule that out. And so now six to eight is not the mean that we're talking about when you add in the evidence in this case. Dr. Lippmann told us it was closer to three to four. And when you consider three to four, and even two to three, which she said was rare, but it's not off the table, it's not an outlier anymore. But the experts that the Commonwealth presented refused to acknowledge, refused to change their position. Because in changing their position, they would have to say that she could have been killed after three. And even in the face of evidence that they were wrong, they refused to change their position. Now, what do we know about what happens next? What happens next is the crime scene people come in and they start taking some of the evidence. And they go through the whole house and they take some evidence there. And they told us, when we entered it into the crime scene lab, we listed Cara and Tyler as the only suspect. And what's Cara and Tyler doing at that point? She's giving her a two and a half hour statement to the police without a lawyer. What does she do when they come downstairs? She follows their instructions. She doesn't try to run away. She doesn't try to hide anything. She follows their instructions. They help get her out from underneath Anne Marie Rintala and they tell her, walk up the stairs like this. And they say she followed the instructions. And we know she followed the instructions. Because she goes from there to the kitchen table. And she sits at the kitchen table for hours. And what does she do when she's there? She gives them her phone. Here, look at my phone. Whatever you need. They ask for permission to search her house. She says, absolutely. And if you listen to that recorded statement, you'll hear Detective Whitney say, I thought you owned the house with Anne Marie Rentala. That's why we were getting a search warrant. That's why we even had to wait for a search warrant. Detective Whitney was wrong. Cara Rentala owned that house. And she gave them permission that night Search the house, whatever you need, any room you need. She didn't tell them any room was off, off uh, base. That's what she told them. So she goes down and makes this, this two and a half hour statement and she answers every single question they put to her. Every question. And what do we know? How do we know that that interview was infected with the same bias as the 911 call and Detective McGarrian's hypothetical? Because six minutes and 55 seconds into that interview, you hear Detective Whitney say, so I heard there was some history of domestic violence. She brings it up. It's not something Cara and Tyler brings up. Detective Whitney brings it up. The perpetuation of the lie. And so what does Cara and Tyler do? Does she try to hide the fact that her and Anne Marie and Tyler had issues? No. She goes into a lengthy, almost 45 minutes about all the history between her and her wife. She's not trying to hide anything. She's telling them exactly what's happening. She's answering their questions as they're asking them. And then they want to talk to Brianna. And granted, Brianna's almost three years old. She was turning three in, in um, May. But she doesn't say, let me go with you. She doesn't say, let me talk to her first. She says, go ahead, go talk to Brianna. I don't have any problem, go ahead. And then when they ask her, do you have any marks on your body? And she says, no, here. She, they ask her to pull up her shirt. She pulls up her shirt. They ask her to pull down her pants. She pulls down her pants. There's no bruises. And you see the reaction she has when she realizes there is still blood and paint on her legs. You see that reaction. And I suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that she's not trying to hide anything. 
Now you heard Detective Whitney say, what is that mark on your neck? Remember that? The mark on the neck thing. And she says, it's, it's a hickey. And Detective Whitney says, doesn't look like a hickey. So what do you do as a detective when you make that type of, of statement to a witness who's cooperating with you? If you really think there's an issue, don't you bring in crime scene services and say, hey, take a picture of that? Because we know that when the restraining orders were issues, that they took a picture of Kyra Vitala's neck. And they entered it into evidence. Exhibit 39. That was the, rest the restraining order hearing. And that was the picture they took when they thought they saw something on Cara Rotala's neck when she said, this is what it was. So why in the world, when you're giving a two and a half hour statement to the police and a seasoned detective says she sees something, doesn't it get documented in any way? You know why? Because she thought it was so insignificant she didn't even put it in a report. She writes a report about the interview, and she never mentions what she says doesn't look like a hickey to her. How does she not document that? It was so important, and it was so odd, she described it to you. Are you wondering what it actually looked like? Because if you are, that's reasonable doubt. Because the Commonwealth has the burden in this case. Now, once you get beyond her statement, that she gives them access to her phone. She gives them access to um, search the house. She gives them access to Brianna. And then what happens? She goes home. She's looking for Brianna. And she gets back to the neighbor's house, and Brianna's not there. And her family's not there. And she doesn't even know where she's going to go at this point. And Detective Whitney drives her to her friend Michael's house. That's what he asks. And then they ask her to come back the next day and answer more questions. And does she say, no, I'm not coming back? She says, right, I'll, I'll be there. What time? The only issue I have is I have to be out of here by 2.30 or whatever the time it was she needed to be out of there. But she shows up again without a lawyer. She shows up again to answer additional questions. And the Commonwealth wants you to believe, oh, this is when she said there was a different route, a different route about where she went. Well, I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, when you listen to the, to the statement, you'll realize that she answers the questions that were asked. She tells them where she went. She had just found her wife dead in the cellar. And she wanted to help. She wanted to cooperate. And then when they come in the next day and they ask her questions, very specific questions, which route did you take? Did you take a right or a left? Is that on this street or that street? They come up with this. This is supposed to be that Kyra Ritala didn't tell the whole story thing. She answered every question she was asked. And on the second day, was she asked more pointed, specific questions about routes she took? Absolutely. But it doesn't mean she was lying. It's not her job to tell the police what to ask. Now, when you get beyond that, when you get beyond the fact that she was cooperating, when you get beyond the fact that you cannot find beyond a reasonable doubt, in this case, based on time of death, you have the other issues that we have as far as the House is concerned. Now, the Commonwealth, and just so we're clear, Cara Ritala tells them everywhere she went that day. If she was trying to hide something in a dumpster at the McDonald's, why couldn't she have given them a different McDonald's? They never would have found that McDonald's if she didn't tell them about it. She told them exactly where she went. You know what happens? They go and pull video from all of those places, and lo and behold, they say she's there. She's not lying to them. Well, let's talk about that trash can that they think was so important in this case. Let's talk about the trash can. Now, what happens with the trash can, ladies and gentlemen, is they think there's something crazy about the fact that when you're driving your two-and-a-half-year-old around, trying to get her to sleep, 
and she's not sleeping, that there's time lost somewhere. Anyone who's had a child knows. You put your child in the car, you drive them around, you hope they sleep. If they don't, you find other things to do. And that's what happened here. And so when she tells them about this McDonald's, not the other McDonald's that are all over the place, but this McDonald's, they want you to think that she's telling them about that because they ne she never thinks they're going to find what's in the trash. And they go to the trash and they find these rags. And I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that if she changed her child, and they made a big deal of, ooh, look at the pull-ups, and look at the training pants, and you know that she was, she was wearing training No kidding. No kidding. She's two and a half, almost three years old. But you know what they didn't show you, ladies and gentlemen? You know what they didn't bring in to you? They brought in the rags. Let's talk about the rags. Let's look at the rags. Let's, let's photograph the rags in this case. And they even showed you a photograph of this maroon rag, which they want you to believe there's something nefarious about it. And I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, this is exhibit 143, the maroon rag. Now, when you look at that, you look at those white spots and you huh. What is that? If it was paint, don't you think they would have told you? Don't you think they would have had it tested? Don't you think they would have said something about it? They examined all this evidence. So don't look at this photo and think that it's paint, ladies and gentlemen, because there's no evidence to that fact. And the fact that the Commonwealth put it in and didn't actually introduce the rags so you could see it yourself, it's their burden, not ours. Now, in this case, when you get beyond the, the, the fact that Cower and Tyler tells them about McDonald's, let's talk about the trash can at McDonald's. Because that's a big part of the Commonwealth case. This is Exhibit 79, the trash can. This is where the rags they say came from. And they're going to suggest to you those rags are the same rags that came from underneath the sink at Cower and Tyler's house. Even if you believe that, so what? <clears throat> so what? They're going to say, oh, she wasn't changing a diaper because Brianna wasn't wearing diapers. No kidding. No kidding. So my question to you is, what did the rest of the trash look like in there? Why didn't they take a picture of that? When the trooper told you he went and took this bag out of here and he poked a hole in the bottom of it and brought it all back to the house, which, by the way, isn't standard practice, but okay, why don't we have any pictures of the inside of the trash can? How do you know as you're sitting there right now, there isn't a pull-up in that trash can? How do you know, ladies and gentlemen? It's their burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and you don't know. Because they never took a single photo of the inside of the trash can. Believe us when we say it was only McDonald's bags. Are you kidding me? Why don't we have that photo? Because you're thinking, huh, what's in that trash can? That's reasonable doubt. Now, when you get beyond the idea of the diaper, when you get beyond the fact that she tells them about McDonald's, when you get beyond the fact of the maroon rag, let's talk a little bit about the paint. Now, certainly Anne Marie's body is covered in white paint. And the inference the Congress is going to want you to draw is that that was to cover up trace evidence. Why does Cairo and Tala need to cover up trace evidence in her own house? Why would she need to cover up trace evidence? I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, she does not. She's not she has no obligation to cover up trace evidence. Even if they found her prints all over that body, she's married to Anne Marie Rentala. She has no need to cover trace evidence at all. But you know who does? Mark Olsen. Because if his trace evidence was found on Anne Marie Rintala's body, that would be a huge problem for the Commonwealth. Think about that. And did we hear from Mark Olasak? Nope. Could he have cleared up what was going on with him that day? Absolutely. Commonwealth's burden, they didn't put him on. And you're wondering what he would have said? Because that's reasonable doubt. And then they want to get into 
oh, there must have been a cleanup somewhere. There absolutely must have been a cleanup somewhere. And the reason that we know that there was a cleanup somewhere was because of their application of the chemical that turns purple. This is exhibit 157. They made a big deal yesterday of saying, these are the before pictures, these are the after pictures. Look, someone must have cleaned up. If you look at the pictures, ladies and gentlemen, the purple on the pictures is exactly the route that everyone agrees Kara and Tala takes with their bloody socks. It's exactly the route from the cellar to the kitchen table and then down to the bathroom. <coughs> That's where they're finding this nefarious purple. And they presented yesterday this idea that somehow or other you can, you can infer that she cleaned up from the fact that this picture looks, this is exhibit 158. This is the before. And then all the purple was the after. Here's the problem with that, ladies and gentlemen. When they had Kohler testify to what he saw, he was one of the first witnesses a long time ago, but when he said he saw, and there are exhibits to this effect, when Cara Rintala came upstairs, that he could see her footprints that were in blood and paint on the floor, and they introduced Exhibit 4. And if you look really close at Exhibit 4, right there at the top of the stairs, you can see something that looks reddish-brown and looks like a footprint. And so which is it, ladies and gentlemen? Did she create these footprints or not? Because yesterday, the Commonwealth tried to say, before and after, this is evidence of cleanup. But it goes beyond that. When you look at Exhibit 10, which is the walk to the kitchen table, you see in Exhibit 10, right here at the bottom, you see the red-brown stain. And the red, that red-brown stain is consistent with where they put the purple. But here's the question. How does it go from this, with an obvious red-brown stain, to what they introduced yesterday, No red-brown stain at all. How does that happen? We know it's not Cara Rintala cleaning because she's at the police station. So how does this happen? Now, could it be as simple as they were sloppy and lots of people were walking to the crime scene and, and maybe the, the stains go away? Maybe. But how do you explain Polar saying her footprints were there? How do you explain the pictures? Exhibit 10 of the footprints, and then no footprints. If you're wondering how this came to be, how the no prints came to be, that's reasonable doubt. Now, when we're back to the, the paint in the statement, I just have a couple more things to say about that. When we're back to the page of the statement, we know that exhibit 146 is a picture of the paint can the next day. And there's still some pink in there. Exhibit 146. We know it's the next day because it has the placards there, number eight. What we also know is the Commonwealth introduced yesterday a photograph of Brianna's bed. This is exhibit 151 a photograph of Brianna's bed. And they want you to believe, hmm, looks like it was made. Looks like it might have not been slept in. Trying again to discredit Cara Rintala, but you remember that Detective Whitney, before she drove Cara Rintala to Michael's house, Cara asked her to go in and grab some of Brianna's things. And as you sit here today, could she have grabbed a little blanket security blanket that maybe Brianna had? Absolutely. But they don't talk about that. They introduced the bed that was made, and they want you to conclude that somehow Cara Rintala was lying. And I suggest to you that's simply 
not true. And then we have the phone records. We have charts of the phone records. We have, we have exhibits of the phone records. And the phone records, according to the Commonwealth, and what their experts relied on is there was this pattern of calling in the morning, this pattern of 38 calls. 38 calls. That's a huge deal. And that's a pattern. First of all, we have one day. I don't know if one day is a pattern. Do you? But beyond that, what we knew from yesterday's testimony is that Kara Rintala worked on March 29th of 2010. She answered the phone and she was called in. And when she answered the phone and she was called in, she was on the hook for three hours. So now we know Anne Marie Rentaler really can't go to sleep for that three hour period because Kara Rentaler is still on the hook. She might be called back. And we know that that phone call came in and she agreed to work at 948. That's what the phone records show. 948. 10.48, 11.48, And it's right around that time that the phone stops, that, that, that Amory Rintala stops making phone calls. Think she could have been exhausted at that point if she didn't get to go to bed? Think she could have been sleeping? Almost says, nope, not sleeping, must have been dead. She had worked the night before. She was working the following night. The fact that she doesn't answer her phone doesn't make her dead. It makes her tired. Her phone is in the bed. It doesn't mean she was dead, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> now, we know from the exhibit that we introduced yesterday, the overtime ambulance account. And we know that Carmentala showed up at, she was called at 9.48, and that she was done by 10.25. We know that. And so is it really a pattern at all when you get called in and now you have to be available to watch your child? Is that really a pattern of Anne Marie Rintala's calls? How do we know? We only have one day. But we know three hours she was on the hook. And then the call was going to say, what about these calls in the evening and all throughout the day from her, from her work that she didn't answer? Well, we learned yesterday, you don't pick up the phone unless you have three hours available. And if you're with your two-and-a-half-year-old, almost three-year-old, you can't pick up the phone because you don't have the three hours available. And if you don't pick up the phone, there's nothing that happens to you. But if you do and you refuse, it's a problem. So did Kara Rintala not pick up work calls when she was with Brianna? Absolutely. But the inference the Commonwealth wants you to draw is because she was killing her wife? Not even close. Not even close. Now, now we get to the people that the Commonwealth knew about and they didn't investigate. The first one is Collar Danielli, former girlfriend, $10,000 in debt. Says she was at the gym for four hours, but her ATM says she withdrew money somewhere else. We don't know if that's true or not true. We only know the police had that information and they didn't investigate it. That's what we know. And then we know the Commonwealth didn't call Paula Danelli in here for you to hear where she was that day. Their burden, they didn't call her. You can consider that when you can consider when you consider reasonable doubt. But more than that, they ignore Mark Olasek. And what do we know about Mark Olasek? He's in love with Anne Marie Rintala. That's clear. That he gives a statement where he says he gives her kisses on the side of the mouth. A weird thing to say. That's what he says. That they hug each other. That they go to the movies together. They go to dinner together. That they hid their relationships from their spouses together. But the thing about Mark Olasek that should have raised these red flags for the Commonwealth if they weren't 
having blinders on investigating this case, if they weren't influenced by that initial lie of domestic? How does it not raise a red flag when someone like Mark Olesak, within days of the crime, comes in to talk to you and lies? Says, where, where was I that day? Oh, I was, went to physical therapy and then I was home the rest of the day. That's where I was, I was home the rest of the day. That's a lie, bold-faced lie, we know it's a lie because we have his debits from that day and we have his phone and we know it's a lie. So, so I guess where I am at that is don't you as a detective, as a homicide detective, call him back in and say, hey, why'd you lie to us? Why'd you tell us you were home all day when you weren't? They don't do that in this case. Nobody even asks him why he lies. In fact, Detective Whitney said he was cooperative. And here's her version of cooperative. He comes in, he tells them a lie that, he's, that he was home all day after physical therapy. And then he shows them screenshots of his phone. He shows them the communications that he has with Anne Marie Rintala that day. But you know, this is exhibit 69. You know what's not there, ladies and gentlemen, on the last page? You know what he deleted when he was trying to show them that he didn't need to be a suspect? He deleted the 153 text. So his texts go from 1146 to 815 that night. Why is he putting that in front of the police days after Ian Marie Rentaler is killed? Why is he lying to them for a second time now, showing them these screenshots where he's deleted his contact with Ian Marie Rentaler? It and why does anyone ask him about it? How did the police not ask him about it? But not a single police officer said, hey, okay, it's bad enough you came in and lied and said you're in the house all day and we know you're not, but why'd you show us this? These screenshots where you deleted the, the information that you texted Anne Marie Rintaler at 152 or 153. And here's the question, ladies and gentlemen, that nobody in this investigation asked. How did he know that 153 was important? How did he know that he was the last person um, to text Cara and Tala that day? How did he know? And why doesn't he, if he just wants to get rid of all of his texts that day, why does he get rid of the 815? The 815 that says, call me on your way home. How did the police not ask him? Why did you delete that text? How did the police not ask him, why didn't you delete the 815 text? How did they not consider him a suspect? How does that even happen? And then you get into the text that you, you do see. So the way they find out Olasak is lying isn't because Olasak tells him he's lying. They look at Anne Marie Rintala's phone and they see she has this text that goes unanswered. And they track down the number and they know it's Olasak. And so what do they do? Do they subpoena the records from the phone company? Of Mark Olasak's phone? Nope. Do they go and talk to Mark Olasak and ask him why he deleted that? Nope. What do they do? They say, hey, could you do us a favor? Could you send us, when you get around to it, not right now, we're not in a rush, but when you get around to it, can you send us your phone records? And then can you send us your bank records for that day? Yeah, I can do that. Months pass. Months pass between their request and when Mark Olasak ultimately sends those records. And nobody cares because they already have Cara and Tala as their sole suspect. They already have their investigation with blinders on. They don't think they need to look anywhere else. But what else do we know about Mark Olasak other than there's no explanation for deleting that text and nobody ever asks him? What else do we know? Is the texts that Ian Marie Rintala are sending him suggest that she says he says the word "I love you," love you, He's texting that back and forth. As a detective, you want to ask him about that? What does that mean? Why are you guys saying you love each other? Like, what, what's happening? And then you find out they go on this trip to Connecticut a few days before she's killed. And you find out that 
She convinces Mark Olesak to give her $350 for a dog that she never buys. And then on the day of her death, she asks for an additional $20 for a crate for a dog she doesn't have. But ladies and gentlemen, we know Mark Olesak lied. We knew he, he wanted a relationship with Anne Marie Rintala. We knew he was waiting for his Easter kiss on the lips and a big one, that that motivated him to maybe want to go stand in line for the attic pad to Anne Marie Rintala. But the thing that is most concerning that the police never followed up on is this idea that he said, I'm a great friend until I find out you lied to me. Now, do any of the police officers say, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? Who lied to you? Wouldn't that be the natural question you would ask? They don't ask that question. Nobody says anything. And then we have, after you get over the deleted text, after you get over the, the, the several lies that he tells, we have his next story about Bob's discount furniture. I remember now that you caught me in my lies. I remember now that I went to Bob's furniture with my wife and my daughter that day. That's where I was. I was at Bob's furniture. I don't know if you were there or not. It doesn't matter. What matters is nobody went to go get the video at Bob's furniture. They want you to believe that he was there, but his own wife said the day that his, her daughter usually comes to the house is a Wednesday, not a Monday. This crime took place on a Monday. How do they not follow up with that question, ladies and gentlemen? How do they not ask that? Now, the next thing that we know is when they finally get his bank records, which I think sometime around July of 2011, and they don't get around to actually checking them out until 2012, because why do they need to? They already charged power in the top. But when they get the bank records, they have this entry of Mark Olesak going to Walmart at 4.30 on the day that Anne Marie Rintala is killed to buy a $7 pair of pants. And you have the receipt. And the thing about that, ladies and gentlemen, is according to what Detective Whitney said, his, his wife and his daughter don't ever remember being at Walmart, don't remember him being at Walmart, but we know he was there. It's on his, it's on his debit card. We know he bought a $7 pair of pants. Why aren't they asking those questions? Why did you need to go and buy a new pair of pants on the day that, Car that, that Anne Marie Rintala was killed? What was so urgent that you needed to go to Walmart in the middle of the day at 4.30 in the afternoon and buy those pants? And then why don't you, homicide detectives, go get the video from Walmart? What does he look like when he's in there? Does he have paint all over him? If you're wondering if he did, that's reasonable doubt. Well, let's get back to what I believe the Commonwealth will say Mark Olesak would never have been able to do this because he wouldn't have had time to clean up. We already know, I'm not even sure there was a cleanup. I think there was a sloppy investigation. You heard how all of the, the officers were walking in and out, no booties on, no gloves on, using the same door a million times. They can't even get any prints off the door because so many people have used it. They're walking through the house without any protection. But ladies and gentlemen, what you need to understand about what the police ignored in Mark Olesak is that they say there's something nefarious about the fact that Cara Rintala isn't making any calls. I think they say between um, the hours of 3 and 5, 6, doesn't make any calls. And that's concerning to them. You know who else doesn't make any calls? If you look at Exhibit 67, Mark Olesak. 
My goal is that it doesn't make any calls from 11 a.m. on October 29th, 2010, until 9 p.m. that night. Is there a single police officer who asked him, why weren't you using your phone that day? And then in terms of text messages, from his text message at 153 that he deleted, there's not an outgoing text in this exhibit, his own phone records, until 8.15 that night, the one he doesn't delete, to Ann saying, call me when you get home. How do they not ask that? When they get these records in November, even though they've already charged Cara Ritala, how do they not go back and go, wait a minute, you weren't on your phone. You weren't texting. What's up with that? Nope, they don't do that. Now, you expect the Commonwealth going to say that he would never have had the time to clean up. But you know what else they don't ask him about? When Cara Rattel leaves to go to work that morning, and she gets a call at 9.48, at 9.50, 9.50, on March 29, 2010, there's a five-minute call from Anne Marie Rentala to Mark Olson. Now, what she's saying, we don't know. Could she have told him to come over at 3 o'clock because she's going to send Cara out with Brianna? We don't know. And you know why we don't know? Because nobody ever asked. When you find that five minute call right after Cara Rentala leaves for work, don't you go back to Mark Olson and say, hey, what's this five minute call about? What were you guys talking about then? Because if you have a doubt in your mind about what they were talking about, that's reasonable doubt. As we sit here today, we don't know what that conversation was. We know that they were getting very, very good at deceiving their spouses. We know that they had spent that entire day in Connecticut, and they both lied to their, to their spouses about that. And then, the text that he deletes at 153, that's the, the cancer text. I'm so sad my sister has cancer. You know what's odd about that? Not a single call to anybody in his family. He just found out, according to his text, that his sister had cancer. You don't make a phone call? You don't go, hey, how you doing? You don't send a text? Hey, I can't believe this happened. What are we going to do? How are we going to support her? Nothing. And when the police find that out, what do they do? Absolutely nothing. But still, Detective Whitney sat on that stand and said, Mark Olasak was cooperative. Because they had the blinders on. They believed they already had their person. They didn't follow the evidence here. They didn't investigate this case the way it should have been investigated. They didn't follow any of the leads. They believed the dispatcher who said it was a domestic. They conducted their entire case based on that lie. And even in the face of this evidence, that Mark Olasak, in love with, with, with Anne Marie Rintala, sleeping in her sleeping bag, months after she had passed away. And when they asked him about that, at that point, when they ask him about the sleeping bag, do you think that's a good time to ask him about the five-minute call? Do you think that's a good time to ask him why he deleted the text? Do you think that's a good time to ask him why he lied to them? Would have been the perfect opportunity, but they didn't ask. And they didn't ask, ladies and gentlemen, because they had already decided. And so you didn't ever hear them go and search Mark Olasak's house. You never heard anything about them searching his car. And we heard, let's not forget, the day of testimony about following the car and following the car. And here we are, look at what, what might be in the back of the car at that point. What difference does it make? Because the Commonwealth didn't ask their, ex or their witness about the swabbing of the car, but I did. And when they swabbed the entire back of Car Rintala's car, they found no evidence of paint, no evidence of blood. None, not a speck. 
So why did we watch the car for two hours? I don't know. They want you to believe something happened there. It doesn't matter what happened because there's no evidence of blood and there's no evidence of any paint. And as we sit here right now, we don't know what Mark Olasak's car looked like that day because nobody bothered to look. Now, when you get beyond the lies that Mark Olasak told, when you get beyond the fact that nobody asks him why he buys the pants at 4.30 in the afternoon, you're left with his statement, I'm a good friend, and to be lied to me. Now, could Mike Olsack have come by that house that day and realized there was no dog? I don't know. They didn't call Mike Olsack. Could he have realized he was duped again by Anne Marie Rentala? Sure. Would that have been a motive to kill her? Absolutely. Mark Olasak had sacrificed his life for her. He went against his wife's recommendation and urging not to see her, and he couldn't resist. Then let's think for a second about the earrings that are found. Now, we know that Anne Marie Rentala loved expensive things. And we know Kara wasn't buying her anything expensive. So who bought the earrings? And how did the earrings get out of her ears that night? Because if you're wondering if Mark Olasak bought those earrings and demanded them back that day, and that's how they end up, one of them embedded in Anne Marie Rentala's back and one in the front porch or the, or the side door, that's reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I don't know if that happened. So evidence that happened. I'm just saying, why aren't they asking? Why doesn't anyone ask, hey, Mr. Olasak, did you buy her these earrings that happened to be at the crime scene? So they ignored it, just like they ignored the bio glow when they, they, when they didn't look into Carla Danielli. She went to Annie. No even asks. And so when you look at this investigation, it was decided from the day that, that the 911 call came in and said it was a domestic. That was the blinders that McGarrion had on the entire time. And we'll never know what McGarrion would have said, could have said, would have done, because they never called him. And it's their burden. And you can consider that when you're considering whether or not they prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Because if you're wondering what he said, that's reasonable doubt. But ladies and gentlemen, when you take the blinders off, when you look at the information regarding time of death, without blinders. When you look at the Olasak information, without blinders. When you look at the lie after lie after lie that they don't investigate, without blinders. You'll come to one conclusion. And that's the Commonwealth has failed to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because Kara Ritala didn't kill her wife. And I'll ask you, when you deliberate, to find her not guilty. Thank you. Lord, may we approach sidebar, please?
Um, members of the jury, we're just going to take a very short break um, before the Commonwealth's closing argument. So uh, I'm just going to be, uh, I'll just ask that you be back in, um, we'll, we'll bring you back in roughly 10 minutes.
Tala's murder was not a random act of violence. It did not occur out of the blue. She was not strangled to death by some outsider. She was murdered by the one person, the only person, who had the motive, the opportunity, and the means to commit this crime. That one person was her own wife, the defendant. Now, Anne's murder was the tragic culmination of an unhealthy, tumultuous, volatile, unstable relationship that was their marriage. This truly was a love-hate, hot-cold, stay-go, unstable, tug-of-war relationship. Now sure, there were happy times. You've seen some pictures, vacations, birthday parties, where somebody might pull out a camera and say cheese. But there were just as many, if not more, bad times. Moments when nobody's gonna snap a photo to preserve that memory. The arguments, the stressors, as the defendant would say in her interview. Pushing and shoving Things getting, quote, out of control, as the defendant herself said to Detective Whitney. Escalating to the point of restraining orders, divorce filings, an assault and battery arrest, 911 calls, each alleging physical, verbal, psychological abuse. And caught in the middle of this marital storm, this unhealthy relationship, this tug of war, their daughter Brianna, two and a half years old. The subject of tug of wars and competing restraining orders, divorce filings, who one day discovers that one of her mothers is no longer there. Now this isn't just my characterization, my dramatic flourish of their relationship. Most of what I've just said came from the defendant's own mouth during her interview with Detective Whitney on the night that Anne Marie was strangled to death. And that emotional roller coaster, a 911 call that you heard in May of 2009, the day the defendant was served with divorce papers and saw that Anne was going for custody of their baby. And the restraining order hearing in the Eastern Hampshire District Court, which you heard before that very stern judge, when the defendant says, Today, I have reached all that I can take. And this was still with nine months yet to go before Anne's murder. Time and time again, the defendant expressing fear of losing her house, of losing her job, of losing her career, her livelihood, and most importantly, losing her baby. Remember the words on that 911 call to the dispatcher, where the dispatcher, dispatcher's asking her, do you want to come down here or should we go there? And Kara says, 
what if Anne tries to rip the baby out of my arms? Time and time again, nerves being struck. The defendant talking about how she got bamboozled by Anne in that arrest for assault and battery. And do you remember how Chief Wishart described when he informed Anne, excuse me, Kara, that she was being placed under arrest, her demeanor switched like a flip, flipped like a switch, rather. That's not going to happen. I'm not being arrested. Now, why does all of this matter? Is the Commonwealth just trying to air out this couple's dirty laundry? No. This evidence provides a window into the defendant's state of mind, her mental state, her emotional state, and ultimately leading up to and culminating in that final fatal altercation, her motive, the reason why we're here today, what led her to strangle Anne to death. In that restraining order hearing in May of 2009, which you heard, and which I'd like to play a segment of again in a moment, the judge made crystal clear to them that if he either ever saw either of them in his courtroom, again, complaining about what's happening at home and the child, who's going to live where, who's going to get Brianna, he made it crystal clear that if they came back into his courtroom, the consequences would be swift and they would be severe. Now let's listen to a segment of what the judge told Anna Marie and Kara in May of 2009. I play games with this. The two of you can either deal with this as adults and deal with it in the probate court as your marriage dissolves, or I'll take it. If you want, I'll call DCF right now. And I'll have DCF come in here and I'll indicate to them that I don't think either one of you is, is stable enough to deal with that child. That's how close I am to going off this bench and picking up the phone right now. Is that what you want? Definitely not. Is that what you want? Now, no one's here to endorse or to opine on whether or not that hearing was handled properly. But from that point forward, no more 911 calls came in from 18 Barton Street. No more restraining orders were sought. No more court appearances. Because everything wasn't suddenly fine. They hadn't miraculously reconciled. The judge hadn't set them straight. But because the courthouse and the legal system was no longer an option for them. 911 was not an option. From that point forward, the turmoil remained behind closed doors, beneath the surface, and under the radar. Now, when their final argument on March 29, 2010, had gone too far, and Anne tumbled down those stairs, landing on the cement floor, bloodied and bruised. The defendant had a decision to make. Call for help, and almost certainly be arrested, lose her job, lose her career, lose her baby, voice of that judge echoing in her head, or make Anne go away. She made her decision, and that decision is what has led us here today. Now, in addition to having a motive to kill Anne Marie, the defendant also had the opportunity to kill her. Only the defendant had the opportunity to kill her. Motive and opportunity two key building blocks for virtually every case. First and foremost, nobody else could have possibly known that Kara was going to unexpectedly, unplanned, leave the house that afternoon with her daughter to drive around in the rain. No one else could possibly have known how long she'd be gone and when she might come back. And once Anne Marie had been strangled to death, no one else would have any reason to spend one second longer in that house, at that crime scene, running the risk of getting caught. 
no one else would have had a reason to stick around and attempt to clean up the scene. No one, that is, other than the self-described number one suspect, which the defendant unprovokedly called herself on the evening of March 29th. Only the defendant would have taken the time in that basement to attempt to clean up the scene, to wipe and swipe the blood stains left behind from her wife. As we see here in Exhibit 137, you'll remember these pictures from Todd Gerard, the LCV that he applied in the basement near the murder scene. Some blood that couldn't be seen until this leuco crystal violet was applied, and suddenly the bright purple fluorescent glow comes out. There is blood that used to be there that the defendant tried initially to clean up and remove. Showing exhibit 139. As Jennifer Creasy testified, wipe and swipe smear marks. Who's going to take the time and who's going to have the reason to even try to do this other than the defendant herself. Every second, a risk that somebody comes home, somebody knocks at the door, they're caught red-handed. The defendant didn't have that fear. This was her own home. Only the defendant would try to stage the crime scene to look as if it was something that it wasn't. Hacking away at the door jam with this shovel. This damage inflicted by this shovel the crescent marks shape, they match. The paint residue on the tip matches the paint on that door. Hacking away at the door jam, but not at the door. Not a single scratch on the door. The glass isn't shattered. The door jam isn't busted. The doorknob still works. And that door had to have been open when some of this damage was inflicted. As Trooper Gerard testified, there's damage and deformations on the inner section of the, the weather stripping that's not exposed unless the door is open. And if somebody is hacking and hacking and hacking away at that door to try to get through that door, they're sure as heck going to hit the door. They're going to hit the door now, they're going to hit the glass. But this was not an attempt to get through that door. This was an attempt to make it look as though this were a break-in. And who other than the defendant, when she's done hacking away at that door, would take the time to walk across the breezeway, lean the shovel up nice and neatly against the garage, and then leave the scene? This was either the most considerate and tidy random burglar to kindly put the shovel back or it was the defendant herself. Only the defendant would have done these things. Nothing missing from inside the house. No rummaging, jewelry, valuables in plain sight. This was not a burglary. After the defendant initially at the scene attempts to alter the state and stage the crime scene, she now shifts into the next phase of her cover-up and her concealment she attempts to create a digital alibi for herself. She leaves the scene of the crime, and her whereabouts are unknown for several hours, during which she's allegedly driving around in the rain, and depending upon which time she talks to the police, which route she took, driving for hours and hours and hours. Then at 4.48 p.m., she starts blowing up Anne's phone. Now remember, the whole reason the defendant claims she left the house that afternoon was to let her wife get some badly needed sleep. She'd worked the overnight shift. She was going in again that night at 8 p.m. So according to the defendant, she leaves around 3 o'clock, at which point Anne is still awake, Remember in her interview, she claims Anne says, Kara, it's not working. Go to the mall. The baby runs in. Kara's there at the doorway. They are, quote, tit for tat at the doorway, which if you didn't hear it the first time in her interview, you'll hear it again. They're tit for tat at the doorway. 
before she leaves at 3 p.m. with the daughter to let Anne get some sleep. 4.48 p.m., 108 minutes later, she texts Anne, you still asleep? 4.52, sorry if this is waking you. 5 o'clock, back at the mall again. 5.18, do you see what time it is? Now, I'd like to show you on the presenter a compilation of some of the evidence that you've seen and heard in this case. 1.27 p.m., the defendant misses a phone call. 3.49, misses another phone call. 4.48, texting Ann for the first time. 4.52, texting Ann again. 5 o'clock, texting Ann. 5.05, enters the Holyoke Mall. And interestingly, in that 5 o'clock text, back at the mall again, how many times was she there that day? She claims one. Why is she saying again? After making a few miscellaneous low-cost purchases at the Children's Place, at the Gap, being on video, being places, doing things, leaving this digital trail behind, she leaves the Holyoke Mall and she heads to McDonald's. On the way, she texts Anne, 5.40 p.m. This is now two hours and 40 minutes after supposedly wanting her wife to get some sleep. She pulls into the McDonald's parking lot, 5.47. Oh my God, keep getting her. And along the way, before she even gets there, she leaves this voice message for her wife. Oh my God, keep getting her. I know I'm not going to do that. And hey, hey, listen, it's me again. Huh? Come on, you're sending things to Florida. Like, what's up? You know what I mean? Fine, you get mad, but then, you know, you at least text back or call back. Either way, well, remember we forgot to get stuff for your lunch tomorrow in school. So, yeah. And yeah, we're going home, but we, no, it's not the wrong way. We're going to rip ice. We missed the shopping shop, honey. Anyway. We're not going to be blind, and then I'm like, well, you know what, I'm going to make it to the little because Stop and Stop has been in my pocket, it's the best thing I've ever done in the world. Anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're heading back around the border because we are already gone down to Chickasaw Big Y, and so we're talking about, well, it's not to the couple. That's a little selfish, I know. But anyway, she meets up with us lunch tomorrow. And uh, the apples are not ready, I know they're not ready because they're still so easy, so there's no way to eat them. And, can't send crackers and cheese and crackers and, you know, the, the chili and the and all. Um, and like maybe that's a bit smaller for something. Anyway, bye. Call us. Okay? I'm going to go by. That's one voice message in which she is going to extravagant lengths to explain where she is, where she's been, where she's going, why she's going almost in a stream of consciousness conversation, leaving this message on her dead wife's phone. Now, going back to McDonald's for a moment, when she pulls into that parking lot and she throws out three cleaning rags, she gets out of her truck, in the rain, goes to the farthest most trash receptacle and throws out three rags that are consistent with cleaning rags, kept underneath the kitchen sink at the crime scene. You'll have these photos. You do have these photos. You have the two pink cloth diapers, practically matching cloth diapers. She throws them out in the trash, cleaning rags from underneath the kitchen sink where the cleaning supplies are kept just outside of where that door was left open with a trash can that's uncharacteristically left out of place in her haste to leave the house. Now, she finally arrives at Stop and Shop because after she leaves McDonald's, you catch, you catch your first glimpse in the bed of the truck. There's something there, something there. You can't quite tell what it is, 
when she arrives at Stop and Shop, you get a better view of these items in the bed of her truck, which mysteriously go missing by the time she reaches 18 Barton Street that night. Now, nobody sitting here can say for sure whether those are bags, whether that's a laundry basket. All we know is that these items in the bed of her truck, which she's carting around all afternoon in the rain, they don't make it back to 18 Barton Street. And she never mentions to the police in her interview making any other stops after Stop and Shop. She makes a small purchase of groceries inside Stop and Shop. Interestingly, no pretzels. Supposedly the whole reason she detoured from the Big Y to Chicopee. Nope, let's go to Stop and Shop. Gotta get those pretzels. Doesn't even buy the pretzels. Leaves another voice message, another text message for Ann. Then it's off to Burger King for the mac and cheese, which she purchases at 6.48 p.m. 6.48 p.m., she purchases the mac and cheese. She leaves another voice message for Ann 10 minutes later. Now, this is interesting because 10 minutes later, she's home. Burger King to 18 Martin Street, 8 to 10 minute drive. She's practically home, if not in the driveway, when she leaves that final voice message for Ann. The voice message in which she says, call me, bless you. Why does Ann need to call her, bless you? She then leaves everything in her truck. She doesn't bring in her purse, her cell phone, the groceries. This is according to the defendant in her interview and based upon the evidence at the scene. She looks down the basement stairs, she sees her wife, and what does she do? Rather than rushing down those stairs, not only, let's put aside for a second the fact that you're a trained paramedic, okay? Maybe your training goes out the window at that point, but this is your wife, lying on the floor, unconscious, possibly injured, in need of medical help. Time is of the essence. Yet, she gathers up the baby, goes to the neighbor, asks the neighbor to call 911, goes back to the house, then goes back into the basement, rolls her body, her wife's cold, stiff body up onto her legs, is smearing paint over her body, and is angry when the police arrive. That makes no sense, because that is not what actually happened. The defendant did not come home to discover her wife dead. She came home to discover her wife still dead in the basement. And in one final act of concealment, one last ditch effort to complicate this crime scene, she pours the paint. Paint that was consistently described by the first responders as wet, liquidy, shiny, from which you can infer, using your own everyday life experience and common sense, that that paint had been freshly poured. And ultimately, that created a big problem for the defendant because now you had two vastly different timelines at this crime scene. You had a cold, stiff body versus fresh, wet paint. And those don't match up. All three forensic pathologists who testified in this case agreed that Anna Marie's body was in well-developed, if not full rigor mortis, when first responders first saw her that evening. Dr. Richmond testified that she'd been dead for six to eight hours or more. Dr. Andrew testified that in his opinion, she was dead by one o'clock. Dr. Littman agreed that the average for well-developed to full rigor mortis is six to eight hours. Now, not all opinions are created equally. Dr. Richmond and Dr. Andrew formed their own independent opinions without needing to know what any other doctors had to say on this topic. Dr. Richmond and Dr. Andrew were not play asked to place Anne's time of death either on one side of that three o'clock line or the other side of that three o'clock line. The line that Dr. Littman knew about from square one in which she knew was a critical dividing line in this case. This information that's coming into her head, which she doesn't need to know, is consciously or not affecting and skewing her opinion in this case. 
Dr. Richmond and Dr. Andrew correctly and appropriately took into account the drastic, stark drop-off in Anne's cell phone activity on the day that she died. The type of evidence that all three doctors agreed is important and critical to factor in to help estimate and narrow down one's time of death. Dr. Lippman only had a vague understanding of this evidence, which she had read about, but she never even bothered to see the raw data herself. Dr. Richmond and Dr. Andrew correctly took into account the fact that Anne was lying on a cold or cool cement basement floor, which would slow down rigor mortis, particularly when wearing little clothing on top. And regardless of whatever some dehumidifier may have said in some area of the basement, as far as where the temperature may have been in that section of the room, regardless of the air temperature in the basement at all, as attorneys Capiccio apparently agreed a short, short time ago, that basement floor would be cold or cool in March in New England, sucking heat out of Anne's body. And Dr. Richmond and Dr. Andrew agreed that there was no evidence, absolutely no data, to support the notion that Anne had been involved in some prolonged, physical, vigorous, violent exercise or struggle. Absolutely no evidence. They didn't make assumptions, they didn't speculate. They looked for what the data was, and there was none. Now ultimately, Dr. Lippman had no opinion as to when Anne died. She acknowledged that Anne could have died before 3 p.m., consistent with that six to eight hour range, that average. And remember what two factors she cited for supposedly sliding that average down to maybe five to seven, maybe four to six. She couldn't say how far it would slide down. She cited two key factors. One was this alleged violent struggle. She admitted on cross-examination, I asked her, now doctor, would you agree that there's no evidence, there's no data regarding the duration of any struggle in this case? And she said, yes, I agree. I then asked her, what evidence or data is there that Anne was actively engaged in the struggle as opposed to being on the receiving end, a passive recipient of this assault? She agreed, there's no evidence, there's no data for that. She agreed that not all struggles necessarily speed up rigor mortis. And despite acknowledging that Anne could have been dazed, could have been in tremendous pain, could have been unconscious as a result of the significant head wounds that she sustained, she still held on to this assertion that there must have been a struggle and it must have sped up rigor. What was the second factor that she cited, supposedly, at least on direct examination, for why rigor may have sped up? Obesity. She left you with the impression, until I stood up and asked her questions, that obesity speeds up rigor mortis. Only on cross-examination did she acknowledge, oh yeah, there is literature out there saying that it can actually slow it down. And she ultimately couldn't say one way or the other whether obesity played any factor in this case. For whatever reason, Dr. Littman consistently shaded and tilted her conclusions without any supporting data to the benefit of the defendant. After admitting that an opinion is only as good as the evidence and the data that it's based upon. Dr. Andrew and Dr. Richmond acknowledged there are some factors potentially on both sides of the ledger. Some might speed it up, some might slow it down. They essentially cancel each other out. But Dr. Lippman only wanted to focus on the factors that would skew the data and skew the results for the defendant's benefit. This highlights the difference in this case, and this, I think, is really what this case boils down to. What is possible versus what is probable. And the judge will instruct you that when you are analyzing the evidence in this case and you're applying the standard of proof of beyond a reasonable doubt, he will instruct you that that term does not mean proof beyond all possible doubt. Because everything in the lives of human beings is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. That's where the defense wants you to land. Things are possible, there are outliers, anything's possible. 
You're here to decide what's likely, what's probable, what's beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard that each and every one of you agreed you would apply when you were chosen for this jury. You said you understood the concept and you would apply it. And we are asking you to do that. Now, on the night Ann's body was found dead, the defendant agreed to go to the Granby Police Department to give a statement. If you saw that interview, you'll have the opportunity to see it again. When Detective Whitney asked the defendant about the turbulent history that she and Ann had, it's as if that released a floodgate. The defendant proceeded to spend approximately two-thirds of her interview that night with Detective Whitney chronicling their unstable relationship, the stressors, the financial stressors, the adoption of Brianna, which the defendant called another stressor, the pushing, the shoving, the arguments getting out of control. And despite repeatedly claiming that she did not want to speak ill of her deceased wife, she just kept doing it. Now, in light of this overwhelming evidence that consistently points back to only one person having the means, the motive, and the opportunity to commit this crime, the defense instead focuses its attack on the police investigation and their supposed failure to take a hard look at Mark Olitsack and Carla Danielle. Well, let's talk now about what the investigators actually learned, what knowledge they had, and what that led them to do. Within days, they interview Mark Olitsack and Carla Danielle. They recover surveillance video at health tracks in East Longmeadow showing Carla Danielle getting there at three, swiping in at three, going out for a run, getting back at seven, and pulling away in her car at 7 p.m. 3 to 7 p.m., her whereabouts are documented in East Longmeadow. And that supposed tanning appointment, if you remember back two weeks ago today, when Attorney Scapiccio said to you in opening statements, which is not evidence, that you'll hear that Carla Danielle supposedly went for a tanning appointment during her run. Come to find out that was based on a typo in a report and the underlying note said, no, that was 7.53 p.m. That wasn't 17.53 military hours. Trying to create doubt. Trying to paint Carla Danielle as a murderer because of a typo. The police learn that Mark was shopping with his wife that afternoon in Hamden County, up and down Route 20, and his wife corroborates his whereabouts. He turns over his bank records which corroborates his errand running that day. He turns over his phone records, which reveal his texts, his phone calls, not just with Ann, but with everybody else for the entire month of March. He provides a DNA sample. He provides major case prints. And let's not forget those text messages he was exchanging with Ann the morning she died. Those text messages, now whether, again, appropriate or not for a married man to be having these conversations with a married woman, they show that he loved her. He loved her probably more than he should have. But how do you go from those lovey-dovey text messages to driving up there, apparently driving to Granby and killing Ann was on his list of errands that day? That doesn't make sense. 428. We only have that Walmart receipt. The police only got that Walmart receipt because Mark showed them his bank records. And that led them to Walmart. They got the receipt 4.28 p.m. Again, how was he shopping in Walmart in Westfield in Hamden County that day, yet also supposedly up in Granby killing the woman he loves? In light of all of this information that the police obtained during their investigation, they determined correctly that Mark Olitsack had nothing to do with this. There's not one iota of evidence or data in this case putting Mark Olitsack anywhere near Granby on March 29, 2010. That's what the evidence shows in this case. Neither was Carla Danielle. Neither of them had the motive the means, or the opportunity to commit this crime. Only the defendant had those three. 
To say that the police failed to take a hard look at these two completely ignores the evidence in this case. And as with the experts who admitted that their opinions are only as good as the evidence and the data that it's based upon, so too an attorney's argument is only as good as the evidence that supports it. It's the evidence that led us to where we are today. The evidence that you received in this courtroom will guide your verdict. The term verdict meaning speak the truth. This is a search for the truth. Your duty as jurors is to decide this case based upon the evidence that came in and the judge will instruct you specifically on that concept in a little while. You are not to speculate. You're not to employ conjecture. Anne and Kara's final fatal argument began at that side door on March 29, 2010. Yet it ended on the cold cement floor in the basement. Anne was bleeding from several significant pain-inducing wounds to her head. Her heart was still beating. In as little as 10 seconds of pressure applied by her wife's hands to her throat, Anne was likely unconscious. And it took three to four minutes of sustained pressure by the defendant's hands wrapped around Anne's neck to end her life. Three to four minutes during which the defendant could have changed her mind. She could have stopped. She could have backed up. She could have said, this has gone too far. What am I doing? When you're in that jury room, I hope one of you pulls out your watch and just sits there quietly for three to four minutes. And you realize just how long that is. And during that time, the defendant squeezed and squeezed and squeezed until every ounce of life and breath was taken from him. That is what the evidence shows. That is why we are here today. That's why Anne isn't here today. Only the defendant had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to murder her wife. There is no other reasonable explanation for Anne's murder. There is no reasonable doubt that Kara Rintala is guilty of murder. Thank you very much for your time.
members of the jury, the, the next um, part of this trial and the last part before you begin your deliberations will be my instructions on the law. Um, the human attention span is a finite resource, and so I'm going to take another break so you can replenish that resource uh, because my instructions are, are lengthy and uh, somewhat involved and do require um, your full attention. So um, I'm going to take a break until noon, um, and at that point, again, I will give my final instructions. Okay, why don't we just take a short break um, ourselves and, and perhaps um, just reconvene in, in five or, or ten minutes or so and uh, we can uh, finish up our discussion of my charge. Yeah, thank you. Where's the other resource?
Okay, so. Thank you, Honor. For the defense, we have a few uh, uh, quick uh, proposed changes. The first uh, is on page 23 um, in the bias uh, instruction. You list that at fourth, I might ask myself, would I view the evidence differently if the people from, were from different groups, such as different racial, ethnic, or gender identity groups? We think, especially because of the facts of this case, that right before gender identity groups, you should add sexual orientation. So the words, sexual orientation. So in other words, it should read, such as different racial, ethnic, sexual orientation, or gender identity groups. Sexual orientation group. I know. I, I can't think of a more grace. I, I share your uh, resistance to the awkwardness of the phrase, but I can't figure out how to make it smoother. But you get my idea. My, my idea. Um, okay. I, I think there's, there's some language about that earlier on. I, it's, if the, it's not an exhaustive list. Well, we, it, if, uh, if, if you're not giving it, then note our objection. Um, uh, the second point, and I think this is very important in light of the evidence, and I've made the point already, uh, but the, given the Bowdoin instruction um, at page 18 and the reference not only to speculation but unanswered questions at pages 6 and 7, uh, we think that it's important to articulate specifically uh, in the Bowdoin instruction, the uh, the notion that um, the flaws in incomplete police investigation, to the extent the jury considers that relevant, it's not imper impermissible speculation. And so what we would request is on page 18, um, at the end of the carryover paragraph, um, so in other words, after the words, such a failure may create a reasonable doubt as, as to the defendant's guilt, the sentence, I instruct you, this is not impermissible speculation. And then again, um, in the, at the end of the paragraph, if you find that any omissions in the investigation, investigation were significant, at, at the end of that paragraph, again, I instruct you that this is not impermissible speculation. That's our request to distinguish uh, omissions in the police investigation uh, from impermissible speculation and, un and unanswered questions in your mind. Your Honor, I think that's going way too far. It is fair game for the defense to point out that because a certain step may not have been taken, there is no evidence resulting. But then to take it the next step, and now let's speculate as to what that evidence may have been, that I think is a line we should not cross. Okay, so I'm not inclined to, to add that language. Uh, I, I do think it's confusing. I don't think a Bowdoin def defense requires speculation on the part of the jury. Um, it really goes to whether uh, there's bias on the part of the investigators. It goes to whether the investigation is complete um, and therefore reliable, uh, very much in the same way that um, the parties have argued about the respective experts in this case. It doesn't require speculation. Um, so I'm, I'm not inclined to add that language. And I will note your objection. Thank you. And then I'll go very quickly through the rest of them. But so at page four, um, the, in the role of counsel, uh, second or uh, third sentence, it is their role to present evidence in this case that's most helpful to their respective positions. The defense, of course, has no obligation to present any evidence. So we would rest, request that that uh, sentence be stricken. Um, then. Uh, the page is 28, 29, 32, make reference to third prong malice. I understand the court is giving the model instruction. We object uh, to third prong malice because we feel it's confusing and juries can't understand it and it uh, leads to uh, unfair verdicts and it's a violation of due process. On page 31, the Kunin factors, we object to the uh, Kunin factors on the grounds that they require, they permit objective, a finding of the objective existence of cruelty without any subjective intentional infliction of a cruelty. So we object to Kunin factors on that ground. And then on pages 33 and 36, there's this reference to if you find that the defendant has uh, proven um, uh, um, the 
elements of murder, but also that there's mitigation. You shall find the defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter. We think that improperly intrudes on the jury's function, and the word shall should be switched to should. The jury should find the defendant guilty of uh, third prong malice. And then finally, on page 36, duty return the highest verdict. We again think that intrudes improperly on the jury's independence, and we think that should be stricken. Those are our objections. Okay. And I, I think those, for the most part, uh, were uh, listed in your motion that was filed um, yesterday. And so I, I have had a chance to consider more so than the few moments we have now, those arguments. Um, uh, I'm not going to make any of those changes, but um, you're, I think the issue is preserved. You filed the motion. I'm not including them. so. Uh, and I assume you object to that, and that objection is noted. And just to clarify for the record, the, one of those objections is new, the objection on page four to the duty of counsel to present evidence. I, I, we, did, not, I did not recall that one. Um, but um, so I, I think I have adequate time to evaluate um, that proposed change. I, I'm not going to make it. And so again, um, your objection uh, I assume you're objecting to that. Yes. And um, that uh, objection is, I think, adequately preserved. Thank you. Your Honor, if I may, I'm, not, I'm just not sure if the Commonwealth is working off of the most recent uh, updated version, but I just would like to confirm a few points, if I may. Um, in the section regarding uh, the video that was introduced of certain locations, page number, page 19 on the copy that I have where you reference a number of exhibits by number. I've, I've changed those. I thought, I don't, I don't know where I got those numbers from. I thought those were the numbers that I included when I gave the instruction at the time that they were admitted, and I thought everyone agreed. But I could be wrong. Um, I'll take your word for it that the correct exhibit numbers are the ones that you have listed, and I've made that change. Great, thank you. The only other two um, on the alibi instruction, which Your Honor is going to give. I did, I did make that. It's a, a minor change, but I did make the, the changes that you suggested. Great. Uh, I think it tracks better with and, the, the and evidence then, in the case. And then lastly, our request that the jury be instructed that they need not be unanimous on which particular unique factor, which is a correct statement of law. I've seen that result in jury questions almost in every case where that's a theory, uh, and I would ask that that be instructed. Okay. So I, I'm trying to stay consistent here. I don't think that's part of the, the model in instruction. Um, I also don't know that there's going to be much room for confusion here, uh, just given the evidence. Uh, and if it arises, I will, uh, I will instruct them um, in accordance with uh, with that suggested language, but um, Thank you. I, I'm not going to add that. Uh, we just, uh, just for the record, on the alibi change that you're making, I understand the change you're making. We object to that change. Okay, thank you. And that's, that's noted. And, and we have one issue on the uh, jury verdict form, actually, Your Honor. Um, it's a minor one, but important to us. Okay. Um, with regard to two uh, the guilty of murder in the first degree. In both A and B, uh, there's the option of yes and then the option of no. We would prefer, that, well, we request that those be flipped. So it would read A with deliberate premeditation, no blank or, or, or dash, uh, yes dash, and then the same with regard to with extreme atrocity or cruelty. To, to parallel the number one being not guilty. Any objection to that? No. So, thank you. And just one moment. Thank you. And just one moment, Your Honor. Yeah. So I'll just. And then we just want to preserve our objections uh, that we raised in our written motion for um, uh, written jury instructions to the extent that the court's instructions differ from our proposed instructions. I thought I made that clear, I, I, but just, <laughs> please draft the suspenders. I apologize for being. For, belaboring it, but that's our request. Thank you. Last year, if I could just impose perhaps upon the court or the clerk's office, uh, we would very much need to have the most current version in front of us as you're instructing. So if that could either be emailed to save a tree or uh, printed before the, 
you charge SARS, we would appreciate that. I can, I will email that. Uh, I think we've gone over the, the changes. And the, uh, it's often the case that I will catch something as I'm reading it um, and make an additional change. But that's typically a, a typo, something along those lines. Uh, but I can, we can take a short break. I, I will email um, the most recent version, which I, I think incorporates just the changes we've discussed, um, to Mr. Jekinowski, and he can distribute that uh, via email. Is that? Yes. Thank you. Does that work for? Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. That's fine. Okay. So let's just uh, uh, don't go far. I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> Five minutes. I, I really mean that. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay.
Good afternoon. So as I indicated, um, I'm about to give my final instructions on the law. Uh, you may take notes, um, but uh, you will uh, notice that I am reading these instructions. Uh, that is not the most engaging way, uh, I have to admit, to convey this information to you. But I do it for two reasons. First. Uh, to make sure that I um, give you accurate instructions, but also because I plan on giving you a copy of the instructions that I'm reading from uh, as an aid in your deliberations. Now that said, it's important that you still pay careful attention to all of my instructions because what I'm about to say to you uh, are my instructions, not the written instructions that you will receive later. Um, and <clears throat> what I'm about to say won't necessarily uh, reflect what is in the, the written instructions. It won't necessarily be verbatim. Um, and if you find that there's a conflict or discrepancy between what I say and what is written uh, in the instructions that you will be provided, uh, you are to consider what I say and not what is written. Um, what I say here is what controls, again, what I'm about to say to you um, constitutes my instructions on the law. So members of the jury, we are now at the final stage of this trial. You have seen, heard, and received all the evidence, and you have heard the closing arguments of counsel. It is now my duty to instruct you about the law that you are to apply to the facts that you find in this case. I'm going to divide these instructions into three parts. The first part consists of general instructions associated with matters relating to all criminal cases and more specific instructions that relate to your evaluation of the issues raised in this case. The second part concerns the elements of the indicted offense. The third part relates to your deliberations. Now, First, I want to discuss some general uh, and fundamental principles that apply to all criminal cases. They are the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, and the concept of reasonable doubt. This is a criminal case. Any person charged with a crime is presumed to be innocent unless and until she is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that a person has been charged with a crime 
were arrested for a crime, were indicted for a crime, is absolutely no evidence of that person's guilt of any crime. As I explained to you at the outset of this trial, an indictment is nothing more than an accusation. It is merely a procedural vehicle that brings a person before the court for trial so that a jury may determine whether the person is guilty or not guilty. The presumption of innocence also means that no person is required to prove her innocence. A person charged with a crime is not required to explain anything to a jury. Exactly the contrary is true. It is the Commonwealth which must prove each and every element of a particular crime charged beyond a reasonable doubt before the defendant may be found guilty of that crime. If the Commonwealth does not prove each and every element of the particular charge beyond a reasonable doubt, then you, the jury, must find the defendant not guilty of that crime. This burden of proof never shifts. The defendant is not required to call any witnesses or produce any evidence since she is presumed to be innocent. This presumption of innocence stays with the defendant unless and until the evidence convinces you, the, the deliberating jury, unanimously that the, that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It requires the jury to find the defendant not guilty unless her guilt has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit the defendant unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of her guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in this case. And that brings us to the concept of reasonable doubt. The burden is on the Commonwealth to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the charge against her. What is proof beyond a reasonable doubt? The term is often used and probably pretty well understood, though it is not easily defined. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all possible doubt, for everything in the lives of human beings is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. A charge is proved beyond a reasonable doubt if after you have compared and considered all the evidence, you have in your minds an abiding conviction to a moral certainty that the charge is true. When we refer to moral certainty, we mean the highest degree of certainty possible in matters relating to human affairs based solely on the evidence that has been put before you in this case. I have told you that every person is presumed to be innocent until she is proven guilty and that the burden of proof is on the prosecutor. If you evaluate all the evidence and you still have a reasonable doubt remaining, the defendant is entitled to the benefit of that doubt and must be acquitted. It is not enough for the Commonwealth to establish a probability, even a strong probability, that the defendant is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. That is not enough. Instead, the evidence must convince you of the defendant's guilt to a reasonable and moral certainty, a certainty that convinces your understanding and satisfies your reason and judgment, judgment as jurors who are sworn to act conscientiously on the evidence. This is what we mean by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, next, members of the jury, I'm going to instruct you with respect to matters that may have occurred or arisen during the trial, and generally about the evidence and what you may do with the evidence that you have heard in this case. First, let me mention to you again what the respective roles of the attorneys are in this trial. Attorneys have very important responsibilities. It is their role to present evidence in this case that's most helpful to their respective positions. It's also their duty to object when evidence is offered that they believe may be inadmissible under our rules of evidence. As such, any such activity on the part of an attorney in this case in making an objection or requesting a sidebar conference is not to be held against either the Commonwealth or the defendant or any of the attorneys in your consideration of the evidence or in your deliberation of your verdict. Each of the attorneys is carrying out his or her duties, his or her obligations, and his or, or her responsibilities as advocates for the Commonwealth and for the defendant. Now, since determining the facts in this case is your duty and not mine, let me also remind you that you are to draw no inferences favorable or unfavorable to either party because of anything that I, as a judge, may have said or done during the trial of this case. If you think that during the course of the trial I made certain rulings that suggested how I felt the case was going or how any issue of fact should be resolved or how you should find the facts, then you are to ignore it. It would be improper for me to do that, 
I don't intend it, and the decision that you must make as to the facts in this case must be made free from interference from anyone, including me. My role as the judge is to see that there is a fair, orderly, and efficient trial of this case. My role is also to rule on questions of evidence and matters of law and to instruct you on the law as I am doing now. Your role in this case, members of the jury, is the most important role in the trial because you and you alone determine what the facts are. In a sense, you are judges when you do that. You are the sole judges of the facts. It doesn't matter what I or the lawyers think the facts are. All that matters is what you find the facts to be. In deciding what the facts are, you all have certain tools available to you. The primary ones are your own common sense, good judgment, and general life experiences. Don't leave those tools here in the courtroom. Bring them with you into the jury room and use them as you work to reach your verdict. If in the course of the opening statements, closing arguments, or during the trial itself, any of the attorneys, or even I as the judge, call, called to your attention matters of evidence that you do not remember collectively as a jury, then you, are to, then you are free to ignore it. It is your memory of what the testimony was and what the evidence is that controls your deliberations in this case. You alone will determine the weight, the effect, the value of the evidence, and the credibility, that is, the believability of the witnesses. Once you make those determinations of fact, it is then your duty to apply them to the law as I now give it to you. In deciding whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the charge that has been brought against her, you should, of course, of course act without prejudice, without fear or favor, and make your judgment solely from a fair consideration of all the evidence. Emotion or sympathy for one side or the, or the other has no place in your deliberations, and you are not to decide this case on the basis of what you may have learned or heard outside of this courtroom or on the basis of any guesswork, speculation, suspicion, or unanswered questions in your minds. You may not speculate as to what might be or might not have been the facts, and you must not be influenced by the popularity or the lack of popularity of the crime that has been charged. Rather, you must confine your consideration to the evidence and nothing but the evidence, and your decision must be based on common sense, good reasoning, and good judgment. Your decision must be made without partiality and without concern for the effects or the consequences of that decision. Now, let me tell you generally what is evidence and, equally important, what is not evidence in this case. Evidence is what you have heard from the witnesses who have testified here in court before you under oath and given answers to questions put to them by the attorneys. You've had a chance to listen to each witness, to observe each witness, to consider all of what he or she has said and how they have said it. That is evidence. Evidence is also the videotape, audiotape, photograph, document, or any other item or thing that was received into evidence. Of course, the quality or strength of the proof is not determined by the sheer volume of evidence or by the number of witnesses that have been presented at trial. Rather, it is the weight of the evidence, that is, the strength intending to prove or disprove the issues at stake, that is important. Now, some of the things that have occurred during this trial are not evidence, and you may not consider these things in deciding the facts of this case. As I have already told you, the indictment in this case is not evidence. The fact that the defendant was arrested or charged in this case is absolutely no evidence whatsoever with respect to her guilt or innocence. A question put to a witness by either attorney, no matter how artfully phrased, is not evidence and is not to be considered by you unless and until the witness answers or adopts that question. Only the answers given by each witness are evidence. Also, you may not consider any, uh, as evidence any question, answer, or other matter that I have ordered stricken from the record and told you to disregard during the trial. The opening statements and closing arguments of counsel are important helpful and appropriate, but they are not evidence in this case. The personal beliefs of the court or counsel on any issue in this case or on what the evidence is are not evidence. Anything that you may have seen, heard, or read about uh, this case outside of this courtroom or while you were uh, not here sitting in the courtroom is not evidence. My instructions to you on the law and anything that I may have said to you in passing during the course of the trial is not evidence. Now generally there are two kinds of evidence upon which you can rely, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. 
Direct evidence is evidence of what a witness claims to have seen or heard or touched or somehow perceived with his or her own senses. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a chain of circumstances from which you may infer or conclude that a fact exists even though it, it has not been proven directly. You are entitled to consider both kinds of evidence. There is no difference in probative value between direct and circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence is competent to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. An inference is a logical deduction or conclusion that you may but are not required to draw from the evidence that you have accepted as believable. Inferences are little steps in reasoning, steps in which you take some known information, apply your experience, and then draw a conclusion. An inference or conclusion drawn from circumstantial evidence need not be necessary or inescapable, but any inference or conclusion which you do draw must be reasonable and possible. You may not guess, you may not speculate. Further, when the evidence tends equally to give rise to either of two inconsistent propositions, the Commonwealth has established neither proposition. In order to convict the defendant, you must find that all the evidence and the reasonable inferences or conclusions that you have drawn, taken together, prove that she is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, as I've said, your function, among other things, is to decide the credibility of the witnesses. In determining credibility and the weight to be given to the testimony of each witness, you must consider and you must be guided by such factors as the conduct and demeanor of the witness while testifying, the frankness or lack of frankness of that witness, the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the witness's testimony, the probability or improbability of that testimony, the opportunity or lack thereof to see or to know the facts concerning that to which the witness has testified, the accuracy of the witness's testimony, and the degree of intelligence shown by the witness. You may also consider the witness's motive to testify for or against either side, and of course, the interest or lack of interest the witness has in the outcome of the case. You may also take into consideration the age, the character, and the demeanor of each witness at trial, as well, well as any bias that he or she may have shown in his or her testimony when determining whether to, uh, the credit to be given to that testimony. You have great power in this regard. In evaluating the evidence presented by a witness, you as jurors are free to believe everything that a witness says, some of what the witness says, or none of what the witness says. If you do not believe a witness's testimony that something happened, your disbelief is not evidence that it did happen, or that it did not happen, rather. When you disbelieve a witness, it just means that you need to look elsewhere for credible evidence about the issue. If there are any conflicts in the testimony, it is your function to resolve those conflicts and to determine where the truth lies. Now, there's one more point about witnesses to address, expert witnesses. This term refers to witnesses who have specialized training or experience in a particular field. Generally, in cases that are tried in our courts, both civil and criminal, witnesses may testify only to facts that are within their own personal knowledge, that is, things that they have personally seen or heard or felt. However, in a variety of cases, issues arise that are beyond the experience of lay persons, and in those types of cases, we allow a person with specialized training or experience called an expert witness to testify and to te testify not only to facts but also to opinions and the reasons for his or her opinions on issues that are within the witness's field of expertise and are relevant and material to the case. Because a particular witness has specialized training and experience in his or her field does not put that witness on a higher level than any other witness and you are to treat the so-called expert witness just like you would treat any other witness. In other words, as with any other witness, it is completely up to you to decide whether you accept the testimony of an expert witness, including the opinions that witness gave. It is also entirely up to you to decide whether you accept the facts relied on by the expert and to decide what conclusions, if any, you draw from the expert's testimony. You are free to reject the testimony and opinion of such a witness in whole or in part if you determine that the witness's opinion is not based on sufficient education and experience or that the testimony of the witness was motivated by some bias or interest in the case. You must also, as I have explained, keep firmly in mind that you alone decide what the facts are. 
If you conclude that an expert's opinion is not based on the facts as you find those facts to be, then you may reject the testimony and opinion of the expert in whole or in part. You must remember that expert witnesses do not decide cases. Juries do. In the last analysis, an expert witness is like any other witness in the sense that you alone make the judgment about how much credibility and weight you give to the expert's testimony and what conclusions you draw from that testimony. Now, you may have noticed that the defendant did not testify at this trial. The defendant has an absolute right not to testify since the entire burden of proof in this case is on the Commonwealth to prove that the defendant is guilty. It is not up to the defendant to prove that she is innocent. Under our system of law, a defendant has a perfect right to say to the Commonwealth, you have the burden of proving your case against me beyond a reasonable doubt. I do not have to say a word. The fact that a defendant or the defendant did not testify has nothing to do with the question of whether she uh, is guilty or not guilty. You are to draw, uh, you are not to draw any adverse inference against the defendant because she did not testify. You are not to consider it in any way or even discuss it in your deliberations. You must determine whether the Commonwealth has proved its case against the defendant based solely on the testimony of the witnesses and the other evidence presented. Now, a videotape of interviews that the defendant gave to the police has been introduced. I believe it's Exhibit 63. Before you may consider any of the statements purportedly made by the defendant during this interview, as evidence in this case, the Commonwealth must prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that first, the defendant made the statement, and second, that she made it voluntarily, freely, and rationally. In determining whether any statement made by the defendant was voluntary, you may consider all the surrounding circumstances. These include when and where the statement was made, the nature of any conversations with the police or questioning by the police, and the defendant's physical and mental condition including her intelligence, age, education, experience, and personality. Your decision does not turn upon any one factor. You must consider the totality of the surrounding circumstances. So to state the general, general rule once again, you may not consider any statement that the defendant is alleged to have made unless the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt both that the, the defendant made the statement and that she made it freely, voluntarily, and rationally. If the Commonwealth has met that burden, then you may consider the defendant's statements and rely upon them as much or as little as you think proper, along with all the other evidence in the case. Now, in addition, in the video, only the defendant's own statements count as evidence of the facts. The police officer's statements on the video may provide context for what the defendant said, but the police officer's statements, again, on the video are not evidence of any of the facts in this case. But if you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's statements on the video are voluntary, those statements are evidence in this case for all purposes, and you may give her videotape statement as much or as little weight as you deem appropriate. Also, and I mentioned this earlier, I have edited or redacted the video to take out statements that are not evidence, so there may be other breaks in the video, or the video may jump around here or there, you should not guess or speculate about uh, what might have been edited out because those things are not relevant or appropriate for your consideration. And of course, you should not hold these edits against any of the parties because they reflect my decisions and rulings as a judge. Now this video of the defendant's statement along with the other exhibits introduced during the trial will be available to you in the jury room so that you may examine them to whatever extent you wish. You have the same powers with respect to exhibits that you have with respect to the testimony of the witnesses. Look them over and decide the weight that is the value which they deserve to receive. You are not required to believe something simply because it appears in a video, a photograph, or a document. You are not, of course, required to disbelieve it because it appears in that form. You decide whether to believe what an exhibit purports to show and how much weight, if any, to give each exhibit. Certain audio exhibits, and I believe uh, they are exhibits 41, 47, and 54, were accompanied by words or subtitles that derive from a transcript produced at the Commonwealth's request. You may find these words helpful in understanding or interpreting the, the, the audio, but it is up to you and you alone to determine what you hear in these exhibits. 
If what you hear does not match up with the words shown on the screen, you should disregard the words and instead rely on what you hear. Now you've also seen photographs and video that some might, uh, that to some might seem disturbing or graphic. I gave you instructions at the time those images were introduced as evidence that I will repeat now. Your verdict must not in any way be influenced by your reaction to their graphic nature. The defendant is entitled to a verdict based solely on the evidence and not one based on pity or sympathy for the deceased, which might be occasioned by these images. Consider these images only as they may draw attention to a clinical medical status or to the nature of the alleged victim's injuries or to the nature of the incident itself. In addition, to the extent that any exhibit has been edited or redacted, you should not consider or speculate about the edited or redacted portions of the exhibit. As with the video of the defendant's statement, you should not hold these edits or redactions against either party as they are a product of my rulings and decisions as the judge. Now, a failure on the part of the Commonwealth to investigate certain witnesses, conduct, conduct scientific tests, or to otherwise follow standard procedure during the police investigation is a factor you may consider in evaluating the evidence presented in this case. Such a fa failure may create a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt. With respect to this factor, you should consider three questions. First, whether the omitted tests or other actions were standard procedure or steps that would otherwise normally be taken under the circumstances. Second, whether the omitted tests or actions would or could reasonably have been expected to lead to significant evidence of the defendant's guilt or innocence. And third, whether the evidence provides a reasonable and adequate explanation for the omission of the tests or other actions. If you find that any omissions in the investigation were significant and not adequately explained, you may consider whether the omissions tend to affect the quality or reliability of the evidence presented by the Commonwealth. In the alternative, you may consider whether the omissions tend to show the existence of police bias against the defendant in conducting the investigation. All these considerations involve factual determinations that are entirely up to you and you are free to give this matter whatever weight, if any, you deem appropriate based on, the, based on all the circumstances. Now certain evidence was introduced for a limited purpose, which means that you may consider it for that limited purpose and that limited purpose alone. This instruction includes some of the evidence you have heard concerning uh, the quality and or reliability of the investigation. Specifically, you have heard testimony from various witnesses concerning uh, Mark uh, Oleksak and uh, Carla Danielle, uh, as I instructed you at the time. That testimony was introduced solely as it related to what information was brought to the attention of investigators during the course of their investigation and how that information related to their investigation of this case. As such, you may consider it for that purpose and that purpose alone. I gave a similar instruction regarding video taken at various locations. I believe um, exhibits 74, 90, and 99. As I explained at the time those videos were introduced, it is entirely up to you to decide what those videos depict. And in that respect, you may consider them for all purposes. However, to the extent to which you heard testimony from a witness about his interpretation of the video or what he thought the video depicted, that testimony was only admitted as it related to the witness's state of mind and his reasons for taking whatever steps he may have taken to investigate the case further. Now you've also heard evidence about restraining orders, divorce filings, 911 calls, arguments between the defendant and the alleged victim, and that the defendant was arrested and charged with assault and battery, a charge that was later dismissed. You may not take any of that evidence as a substitute for proof that the defendant committed the crime charged, nor may, nor may you consider any of that evidence as proof that the defendant has a criminal personality or bad character. But you may consider this evidence solely on the limited issues of motive, state of mind, and intent, and as to whether there was a hostile relationship between the defendant and the alleged victim. You may not consider the evidence for any other purpose. Now you have heard testimony suggesting that the defendant may not have been present at the place and time when the offense charged uh, in the complaint is alleged to have occurred. Such testimony is commonly referred to as alibi evidence. 
Now, I caution you not to give the word alibi any sinister connotation. It is only a shorthand phrase for a very important issue in this case. Did the defendant commit the crime as charged, or was she elsewhere at the time and therefore necessarily innocent? In considering this matter, please remember that the Commonwealth has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the offense charged. And, of course, uh, that includes proving that the defendant was present at the scene and not somewhere else at the time. The defendant has no duty to call witnesses or produce any evidence on this or any other element of the crime. In this case, you've heard evidence suggesting that the defendant may have been away from her house when this offense was committed. You will have to decide whether you believe that evidence. Obviously, if you believe it, then the Commonwealth has failed to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and you must find her not guilty. But even if you disbelieve some or all that evidence, that doesn't mean that the defendant is automatically guilty. You still must find on all the evidence that the Commonwealth has proved the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, at various times during this trial, you have heard references to prior testimony or proceedings. You may consider the substance of any prior testimony that was introduced at this trial, but you may not speculate about, discuss, consider, or otherwise draw any conclusions from the fact that there were prior court proceedings related to this case at which testimony was taken. Now, before I move on to the elements of the indicted offense, I want to give you an instruction that I gave you at the beginning of this trial. Our system of justice depends on judges like me and jurors like you being able and willing to make careful and fair decisions. All people deserve fair and equal treatment in our system of justice, regardless of their race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender, sexual orientation, education, income level, or any other personal characteristic. You have agreed to be fair. I am sure that you want to be fair, but that is not always easy. One difficulty comes from our own built-in expectations and assumptions. They exist even if we are not aware of them and even if we believe we do not have them. Some of you may have heard this called implicit bias, and that is what I'm talking about. We judges have the same problem, so let me share a few strategies that we have found useful. First, slow down. Do not rush to any decisions. Hasty decisions are the most likely to reflect stereotypes or hidden bias. Second, as you start to draw conclusions, consider what evidence, if any, supports the conclusions you are drawing and whether any evidence casts cast doubt on those conclusions. Double check whether you are actually using unsupported assumptions instead of the evidence. Third, as you think about the people involved in this case, consider them as individuals rather than as members of a particular group. Fourth, I might ask myself, would I view the evidence differently if the people were from different groups, such as a different racial, ethnic, or gender identity group? Fifth, listen to your fellow jurors. They may have different points of view. If so, they may help you determine whether you are focusing on the facts or making assumptions, perhaps based on stereotypes. Of course, your fellow jurors could be influenced by their own unstated assumptions. So don't be shy or hesitate to speak up. You should participate actively in particular if you think the other jurors are overlooking or undervaluing evidence you find important. In fact, when you explain your thoughts out loud to other jurors, you are also helping yourself to focus on the evidence instead of assumptions. If you use these strategies, then you will do your part to reach a decision that is as fair as humanly possible, and that is your responsibility as jurors. Now on to the elements of the charged offense. The Commonwealth has charged the defendant with murder in the first degree under the theory of deliberate premeditation and ex extreme atrocity or cruelty. There are two different degrees of murder, murder in the first degree and murder in the second degree. If you find the defendant guilty of murder, you shall decide the degree of murder. The Commonwealth alleges that the defendant committed murder in the first degree under the following theories, murder with deliberate premeditation and or murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty. To find the defendant guilty on any of these theories of murder, you must be unanimous. That is, all the deliberating jurors must agree that the Commonwealth has met its burden of proving every required element of that theory beyond a reasonable doubt. 
and you should check the appropriate box or boxes on the verdict slip as to each theory on which you agree unanimously. If you are unable to agree unanimously that the Commonwealth has met its burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt either of these theories of first degree murder, you shall consider whether the Commonwealth has proved the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of murder in the second degree. If you are unable to agree unanimously that the Commonwealth has met its burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of murder in, this, in the first or murder in the second degree, you shall consider whether the Commonwealth has proved the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the lesser offense of voluntary manslaughter. I will begin by instructing you on the elements and additional requirements to prove for each of these theories of murder in the first degree. I will next instruct you on murder in the second degree. I will then instruct you on voluntary manslaughter. I will then review the verdict slip with you. So I will first define the elements of murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation. To prove the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the following elements. First, that the defendant caused the death of the alleged victim, Anna Marie Rintala. Second, that the defendant intended to kill the alleged victim, that is, the defendant consciously and purposefully intended to cause the alleged victim's death. Third, the defendant committed the killing with deliberate premeditation, that is, she decided to kill after a period of reflection. In addition to these elements, the Commonwealth must also prove that there were no mitigating circumstances. I will now discuss each of these requirements in more detail. The first element is that the defendant caused the death of the alleged victim. A defendant's act is the cause of death where the act in a natural and continuous, a continuous sequence results in death and without which death would not have occurred. The second element is that the defendant intended to kill the alleged victim, that is, the defendant consciously and purposefully intended to cause the alleged victim's death. The third element is that the defendant committed the killing with deliberate premeditation. That is, she decided to kill after a period of reflection. Deliberate premeditation does not require any particular length of time of reflection. A decision to kill may be formed over a period of days, hours, or even a few seconds. The key is the sequence of the thought process. First, the consideration whether to kill. Second, the decision to kill. And third, the killing arising from the decision. There is no deliberate premeditation where the action is taken so quickly that a defendant takes no time to reflect on the action and then decides to do it. Finally, the Commonwealth is also required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there are no mitigating circumstances. The law recognizes that in certain circumstances, which we refer to as mitigating circumstances, the crime is a lesser offense than it would uh, have been in the absence of a mitigating circumstance. A killing that would otherwise be murder in the first or second degree is reduced to the lesser offense of voluntary manslaughter if the defendant killed someone under mitigating circumstances. Not every circumstance you may think to be mitigating is recognized as mitigating under the law. In this case, the mitigating circumstances that you may consider are first, heat of passion on a reasonable provocation, and second, heat of passion induced by sudden combat. To prove the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree with a deliberate premeditation, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there were no mitigating circumstances. I will instruct you on each of these mitigating circumstances in more detail later when I discuss voluntary manslaughter. Next, I will define the elements of murder in the first degree with extreme atrocity or cruelty. You, you shall consider this theory of murder in the first degree regardless of whether or not you find that the Commonwealth has proved murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation. To prove the defendant guilty of murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty, the Commonwealth must prove the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, the defendant caused the death of the alleged victim. Second, the defendant either intended to kill the alleged victim or intended to cause grievous bodily harm to the alleged victim or intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to the defendant a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. Third, the killing was committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty. In addition to these elements, the Commonwealth must also prove that there were no mitigating circumstances. 
I will now discuss each of these requirements in more detail. The first element is that the defendant caused the death of the alleged victim. A defendant's act is the cause of death where the act in a natural and continuous sequence results in death and without which death would not have occurred. The second element is that the defendant intended to kill the alleged victim or intended to cause grievous bodily harm to the alleged victim or intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to the defendant a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. As you can see the second element has three sub elements which I shall call prongs and the Commonwealth satisfies its burden of proof if it proves any one of these three prongs beyond a reasonable doubt. The first prong the defendant intended to kill is the same as the second element of murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation. The second and third prongs are different from any element of murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation. The second prong is that the defendant intended to cause grievous bodily harm to the alleged victim. Grievous bodily harm means severe injury to the body. The third prong is that the defendant intended to do an act which, in the circumstances known to the defendant, a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. Let me help you understand how to analyze this third prong. You must first determine whether the defendant intended to perform the act that caused the alleged victim's death. If you find that she intended to perform the act, you must then determine what the defendant herself actually knew about the relevant circumstances at the time she acted. Then you must determine whether under the circumstances known to the defendant a reasonable person would have known that the act intended by the defendant created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. The third element is that the killing was committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty. Extreme atrocity means an act that is extremely wicked or brutal, appalling, horrifying, or utterly revolting. Extreme cruelty means that the defendant caused the person's death by a met method that surpassed the cruelty inherent in any taking of human life. You must determine whether the method or mode of a killing is so shocking as to amount to murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty. The inquiry focuses on the defendant's actions in terms of the manner and means of inflicting death and on the resulting effect on the victim. In deciding whether the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant caused the death of the, of the deceased with extreme atrocity or cruelty, you must consider the following three factors. First, whether the defendant was indifferent to or took pleasure in the suffering of the alleged victim. Second, whether the defendant's method or means of killing the deceased was reasonably likely to substantially increase or prolong the conscious suffering of the alleged victim or third, whether the means used by the defendant were excessive and out of proportion to what would uh, be needed to kill a person. In considering whether uh, the means used by the defendant uh, were excessive and out of proportion to what would be needed to kill a person, you may consider the extent of the injuries to the deceased, the number of blows delivered, the manner, degree, and severity of the force used, and the nature, uh, and the nature of the weapon, instrument, or method used. You cannot make a finding of extreme atrocity or cruelty unless it is based on one or more of the three factors I have just listed. In addition to these elements, the Commonwealth must prove that there were no mitigating circumstances. I have already mentioned that I will instruct you on mitigating circumstances later when I discuss voluntary manslaughter. Now, as to murder in the second degree. In order to prove murder in the second degree, the Commonwealth must prove the following elements. First, that the defendant caused the death of the alleged victim. S um, second, the defendant intended to kill the alleged victim or intended to cause grievous bodily harm to the alleged victim or intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to the defendant a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. In addition to these elements, the Commonwealth must also prove that there were no mitigating circumstances. If the Commonwealth proves all the required elements but fails to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there were no mitigating circumstances, you must find the defendant not guilt, guilty of murder, but you shall return a verdict of voluntary manslaughter. 
the requirements of proof for murder in the second degree are the same as for murder in the first degree with extreme atrocity or cruelty, but without the element that the killing was committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty. Now as to voluntary manslaughter, to prove the defendant guilty of murder in the first or second degree, the Commonwealth is required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there were no mitigating circumstances that reduced the defendant's culpability. A mitigating circumstance is a circumstance that reduces the seriousness of the offense in the eyes of the law. A killing that would otherwise be murder in the first or second degree is reduced to the lesser offense of voluntary manslaughter where the Commonwealth has failed to prove that there were no mitigating circumstances. Therefore, if the Commonwealth proves all the required elements of murder but fails to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there are no mitigating circumstances, you must not find the defendant guilty of murder, but you shall find the defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter. I will now instruct you on each of these mitigating circumstances. First, heat of passion on reasonable provocation. Heat of passion includes the states of mind of passion, anger, fear, fright, and nervous excitement. Reasonable provocation is provocation by the person killed that would be likely to produce such a state of passion, anger, fear, fright, or nervous excitement in a reasonable person as would overwhelm her capacity for reflection or restraint and did actually produce such a state of mind in the defendant. The provocation must be such that a reasonable person would have become incapable of reflection or restraint and would not have cooled off by the time of the killing and that the defendant herself was so provoked it did not cool off at the time of the killing. In addition, there must be a causal connection between the provocation, the heat of passion, and the killing. The killing must occur after the provocation and before there is sufficient time for the emotion to cool and must be the result of the state of mind uh, induced by the provocation rather than by a pre-existing pre intent to kill or grievously injure uh, or an intent to kill formed after the capacity for reflection or restraint has returned. Reasonable provocation does not require physical contact, but physical contact, even a single blow, may amount to reasonable provocation. Whether the contact is sufficient will depend on whether a reasonable person under similar circumstances would have been provoked to act out of emotion rather than reason reflection, and on whether the defendant was in fact so provoked. The heat of passion must also be sudden. That is, the killing must have occurred before a reasonable person would have regained control of her emotions, and the defendant must have acted in the heat of passion before she regained control of her emotions. If the Commonwealth has not proved beyond a reasonable reasonable doubt, the absence of heat of passion on reasonable provocation, the Commonwealth has not proved that the defendant committed the crime of murder. Now heat of passion induced by sudden co combat. Sudden combat involves a sudden assault by the person killed and the defendant upon each other. In sudden combat, uh, physical contact, even a single blow may amount to reasonable provocation. Whether the contact is sufficient will depend on whether a reasonable person under similar circumstances would have been provoked to act out of emotion rather than reason reflection and on whether the defendant was in fact so provoked. The heat of passion induced by sudden combat must also be sudden, that is the killing must have occurred before a reasonable person would have regained control of her emotions and the defendant must have acted in the heat of passion without cooling off at the time of the killing. If the Commonwealth has not proved beyond a reasonable doubt the absence of heat of passion induced by sudden combat, the Commonwealth has not proved that the defendant committed the crime of murder. In summary, a killing that would otherwise be murder is reduced to the lesser offense of voluntary manslaughter if the defendant killed someone because of heat of passion on reasonable provocation or heat of passion induced by sudden combat. The Commonwealth has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not kill as a result of heat of passion on reasonable provocation or heat of passion induced by sudden combat. If the Commonwealth fails to meet this burden, the defendant is not guilty of murder, but you shall find the defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter if the Commonwealth has proved the other required elements. Now, members of the jury, I have instructed you on the crimes of murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, and voluntary manslaughter. If you conclude unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty, you have a duty to return a verdict of guilty of the highest crime up to and including the charged offense of murder in the first degree, the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt against the defendant. 
If the Commonwealth does not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of any offense charge, you must find her not guilty. All right, so as I have told you earlier, uh, in order to reach a valid verdict, um, each juror must agree. That is, the verdict in a criminal case, whether it be guilty or not guilty, must be unanimous. What that means is that on this indictment, the jury does not have a verdict unless and until all 12 deliberating jurors agree. You do not have a guilty verdict unless all, um, all 12 agree that it is guilty. And by the same token, you do not have a not guilty verdict unless all 12 agree that it is not guilty. In the jury room, you will have a verdict slip on which to record your verdict. Your four person will mark the verdict slip to indicate either that you have unanimously found the defendant not guilty or that you have unanimously found her guilty of murder in the first degree on the theory of deliberate premeditation and or extreme atrocity or cruelty. You will note on the verdict slip that there is also a box for the theory of murder in the second degree, murder committed with the intent required for the commission of second degree murder. To convict the defendant under this theory, you must be unanimous. That is, all 12 of you must agree in order to find the defendant guilty under the theory of murder in the second degree. And finally, there is a box for the theory of voluntary manslaughter. Again, to convict the uh, defendant under this theory, you must be unanimous. That is, that is, all 12 of you must agree to find the defendant guilty under this theory. Now, the law permits only 12 people to deliberate in a criminal case, and there are more than 12 of you here. So shortly, we will, by random lot, reduce your number to 12. We choose more than 12 originally so that the process may properly go on to a conclusion if someone should get sick or have some other emergency. If you're chosen as an alternate, you will be kept apart in another room from the deliberating jury and you may not discuss the case with anyone. The role of alternate surely will cause disappointment and frustration for whoever is chosen at random, but it is a very important job. First, you have already helped us immensely because typically we cannot start a trial with just 12 jurors. And if we do lose a deliberating juror because of some personal emergency or sickness, I will send an alternate into the jury room to take that juror's place. Now, so important is the role of the alternate that if I need to replace a juror with an alternate juror, I will tell the new deliberating jury of 12 to start again, right from scratch, as reconstituted, no matter how long the deliberations have gone. So if you're chosen as an alternate, please do not think that your contribution here is not valued, because it is. Now, if you are chosen to be the four person, keep in mind that that does not mean that your vote carries more weight. All deliberating jurors have the same status. There's no boss in the jury deliberation room. So why do we need a four person? Well, there are two uh, purposes. The first is to act as your facilitator, to gather everyone around the deliberation table, be sure that everyone has a full and fair opportunity to speak and to share his or her views and to assure that all of you are always deliberating together as a group as you work to reach your verdict in this, in this case. If someone needs a, a break, say a bathroom break, you should suspend until you are all together. Everyone needs to hear everything. The second purpose of the four person is to act as your spokesperson here in open court. When you are ready to return your verdict, we will bring you back out as a group. I will ask you to remain standing. Our clerk will ask the four person on your behalf if you have reached a verdict. And if you have, we'll go through the process of having that verdict reported by the four person on your behalf and then recorded in this case. Now let me just say a few words about your deliberations in the jury room. You have been permitted to take notes and some of you have chosen to do so. You may of course refer to your notes, but you should give no more and no less weight to the views of a fellow juror just because that juror did or did not take notes. Set things up so that each and every one of you can fully and fairly express your opinion about the particular charge you are discussing. Delib deliberate all together, not two or three of you separate from the others. It is probably not a good idea to take a straw vote at the outset of your deliberations. If you do that, you might think that you are bound to adhere to that initial impression and that is most definitely not the case. If you have a strong view about any aspect of this case, no one suggests that you surrender it. 
A unanimous verdict means the unanimous verdict of each juror independently agreeing. But you are required to deliberate together to see whether the views of other jurors affect your views of the matter. Bear in mind that you are not advocates for one side or the other. You are judges, judges of the facts. Do not hesitate to reassess or re-examine your views on the facts and evidence in light of the views of your fellow jurors who have seen and heard exactly the same evidence that you have. If in the course of your deliberations you find it necessary to communicate with me for any reason, please do so by a writing signed by the foreperson. Please state only the question and do not disclose any preliminary votes or views of the jurors. The foreperson will deliver the written communication to one of the court officers who will see to it that it is delivered to me. That may take a few minutes or longer. If you wish to continue deliberating while you wait, that is up to you, or you can wait for my response. I will call in the lawyers and we will discuss the communication and get a response to you, either by return note or I may bring you back and tell you in person. Remember, because I am only the judge of the law and you are the sole judges of the facts, I cannot answer any questions you may have as to what the evidence was or what the facts are. That is not my responsibility. It is yours and yours alone. Jurors, the pace and length of your deliberations is entirely up to you. Your deliberations are to be conducted in secret. You are not to disclose to anyone outside the jury room, not even to the court officers, how you stand numerically or otherwise on the matters before you. The foreperson will have a verdict slipped when you are unanimous as to any one of the alternatives. The foreperson will check the appropriate box, sign and date the verdict slip, and inform the court officers who will bring you back into the courtroom so that you can uh, so that your verdict can be recorded. I'd like to see counsel sidebar.
Members of the jury, I'm just going to repeat a, a couple of sentences. Uh, there's one word that I um, that I may not have um, used that I should have used. So uh, this uh, <coughs> relates to uh, mitigating circumstances. And um, the portion I'm rereading is as follows. Not every, circumstances, every circumstance you may think to be mitigating is recognized as mitigating under the law. In this case, the mitigating circumstances that you must consider are, one, heat of passion on a reasonable provocation, and two, heat of passion induced by sudden combat. Okay, so that concludes uh, my instructions on the law. Um, so we are going to, at this point, um, select a four-person and also the alternates. We'll also need to swear in the court officers, no particular order. I'll do that after I order. Yes, and you can go ahead and announce the four person. Thank you. Juror number 42 in seat 15, the court has appointed you four person of this jury. I shall now reduce the jury to 12 jurors. I ran them a lot. For that, we're going to use this state of the art device. <laughs> Second alternate juror. Is juror number 33 in seat nine. Would you likewise step down and follow the court of Third alternate juror. Juror number 19 and seat 12. Fourth alternate juror. Would be juror number fifteen and C eight. Would please raise your right hand. Do you swear that you will keep this jury in some convenient place until they shall be agreed? That you will not suffer any person to speak to them, nor speak to them yourself unless by order of the court to ask that they are agreed? And do you further swear that those alternate jurors whose names have been chosen shall be kept apart from the other jurors, subject to the same rules and regulations, until the jury has agreed upon its verdict or has otherwise been discharged? So hold it back. members of the jury um, 
we will send you back uh, to begin your deliberations. Um, we need um, a few moments with the exhibits to get them in order. I also need to make copies of these instructions for you, but those will be back shortly uh, for your consideration. while we were waiting um, okay. for uh, to, to finish the instructions. I, I know from the defendant's perspective, um, we are uh, content with the exhibits. We know the Commonwealth is also content with the exhibits. Um, we are, the Commonwealth has produced a blank, clear, clean laptop um, for the jurors to be able to use for purposes of viewing the digital exhibits. I did give the laptop to Attorney Scapiccio earlier this morning so she could look through the entire laptop, make sure that she was comfortable with it going to the jury. I understand she she is. We also, and again, attorneys put it onto the laptop, all of the digital exhibits onto the desktop themselves. And for the record, I'll state that they are exhibits 13, 41, 47, 54, 63, 74, 90, and 99. Again, those are the either video or audio recorded exhibits, not the, not the photographs or, or paper. Um, again, I understand that's by agreement, but I wanted to put that on the record if you're comfortable with that laptop going into the jury room, Your Honor. That's by agreement? I, I don't have any problem with the laptop, Judge, now. Okay. Um, and then the verdict slip? The I, I the just one change. Is one okay. 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 So I will uh, have a, a few typos I caught. I'll fix those, and uh, we'll get copies to the jury mark that we typically mark in this one for identification. Um, but there's really no change of substance that we need to be concerned about. Uh, otherwise, well, we're into the lunch break, so go eat some food, lie down, take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know I do. Okay. Yes, if if uh, I don't need common holes. Yeah, if you write write it down for me.
going to uh, release the jurors uh, for today. We can bring in the jury. Charge to report back in session, please proceed. <clears throat> Members of the jury, um, I'm going to send you home for the day. Um, before I do so, I'm going to give you the same instructions that I've been giving you all along, uh, including not to discuss this case with anyone, including each other. Obviously, you've been discussing the case, um, but that uh, has been um, as a part of your deliberation or during the course of your deliberations. Um, but once those uh, deliberations end for the day, um, the instruction goes back into effect that you shouldn't discuss the case uh, with anyone, including your fellow jurors. So along with that, I instruct you as always uh, to um, refrain from any form of outside research or investigation concerning this case, uh, avoid contact with any of the participants in this case, and avoid all media accounts concerning this case. Um, otherwise, have a pleasant evening, and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 9 o'clock. See you uh, back here at nine o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Get some sleep tonight. Have a good night. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome.